Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Tuesday, February 8th meeting of the Science, Technology, and Energy Committee. We have five public hearings that we will conduct during the course of today. Obviously, with the uh, traffic accident on Interstate 93, folks are going to be filing in slowly over the course of the uh, next uh, several minutes. And unfortunately, we're going to ha have to go ahead and get started, both to be respectful of people who showed up here to testify this morning and also to uh, continue to operate the committee in an efficient manner. But before I call on the uh, opening speaker, our very first duty this morning is to all rise and join together as Representative Bernardi leads us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, so before we begin, begin, a couple of housekeeping measures. If you would like to testify on this or any other bill before the committee today, you must fill out and submit a pink card and pass it along uh, the table so that it reaches myself and the clerk. That's how we keep track of who wants to testify on a bill. Also, it's been pointed out to me by Representative Thomas that if there is anyone here who is hard of hearing, there is a uh, microphone jack on the side of these microphones that we all have sitting in front of us. And if you have headphones, you could plug in to the microphone jack and listen to testimony that way rather than having to rely on the testimony coming through the speakers. I didn't realize that but uh, Representative Thomas pointed that out this morning, so that's something you can take advantage of if, if you so desire. And uh, with that, oh, one other thing that I would remind committee members about, yesterday we conducted an exec session on five bills. There were minority reports assigned. If you have been assigned a minority report, I need that report by 5 p.m. today. So with that, I will open the public hearing on House Bill 1596 FN relative to net e energy metering limits for individual and business customers. And I will turn the floor over to the bill's prime sponsor, Representative Rebecca McWilliams. Thank you, Chair Vose. Um, it's a pleasure to be here, fellow members of Science, Technology, and Energy. For the record, my name is Representative Rebecca McWilliams. I represent the west side of Concord. Um, I'm here today to talk about raising net energy uh, metering limits from one to five megawatts. And I know we've had robust discussions about this in the past. I just want to touch on a couple of points of history on this specific topic. Um, when I joined Science, Technology, and Energy uh, four years ago, we were able to come to a bipartisan consensus on passing increases in net net energy metering from one to five megawatts here in the house. Um, we were also able to pass it at the other body. Um, it was then subsequently vetoed by our governor and we had an override session uh, to try to override that specific bill and we were awful close to being able to do that. We almost got our two thirds majority. So there was definitely a desire by the constituents and by the elected officials of New Hampshire four years ago to get us over that threshold and reach net energy metering so that we could open up the market for um, additional uh, net metering. You can sit down. Go ahead. Sit down. Okay. Um, so in addition, uh, net metering is something that the states around us have been doing successfully for quite some time. Um, we know that Massachusetts has a 4.99999 megawatt limit. Um, <clears throat> Maine and Vermont have also reached the same uh, conclusion that it's good for the market and it's good for creating local energy. Um, one of the things that we have as a challenge here in New Hampshire is that aside from nuclear, which we are very good at producing, um, most of our energy comes from out of state. So we're looking at hydropower from the north and uh, natural gas from pipelines coming from outside of New Hampshire. 
So increasing the net energy metering limit would allow us to then open up the market to increase homegrown energy for private companies and private businesses who would like to do larger solar arrays, but right now due to business constraints are not able to do so because the numbers just don't make sense. But in terms of competition and seeing the other states around us as competition in the Northeast energy market, since we all fall under ISO New England, it makes sense for us to open it up and increase net energy metering so that we can be competitive with the states around us and so that we're not losing out on these opportunities for solar developments that are going to other states because New Hampshire is not considered an opportune state right now without the increase in net energy metering. So this, the intent of this bill is to build on the success that we had last year, um, which, which if you recall, we passed a bill to allow municipalities to increase their net energy metering from one to five megawatts. I know that was a huge win uh, for cities and towns that already had hydro to go bigger and be able to uh, spin the meter backwards at a larger scale. And so I'd like to now open it up a little bit further to private businesses um, and large landowners who are looking to do solar arrays or perhaps large hydro on a private scale because this would benefit the private industry as well as municipalities. So with that, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Representative McWilliams, for that excellent introduction of this bill. And uh, I would now like to entertain questions from the committee about this bill. Do we have any questions? Well, I have a question. Um, I'll go first, but then you're next, Representative Farshall. The fiscal note says that the Department of Energy indicates that there is the potential for the for state, county, and local governments to see an increase in expenditures due to the increased cost of electricity that would result from passage of this legislation. Do you think that local governments would interpret that as the state downshifting costs onto local governments? I think it's a little bit more complex than just saying black and white. Um, increasing net energy metering will increase the cost of electricity. I think that's um, a broad statement. I think if we can parse that out a little bit further, um, what we're looking at is individual cost for a greater good, right? So we're talking about increasing local homegrown energy. Individual bills may see a very small increase in the short term, but in the long term, we're talking about reducing transmission costs because it is homegrown. So while there may be a little bit of a curve as we ramp up and increase our local homegrown solar larger arrays, overall, we're going to see a leveling and possibly reduction in transmission costs because we are creating our own energy. So the question about whether municipalities would see that uptick in initial cost as a downshifting I think it really depends on how you're characterizing it. Um, obviously, when the market changes and if costs change, then there's, there's going to be a reaction from everyone who's involved in the game. Uh, but whether we call that a downshift or just a change because the market has changed is really a question for how each municipality interprets the market and what's happening. Um, I will tell you that as a representative from Concord, we have committed to going to 100% renewable electricity by 2030 as a city. And so we are actively looking at ways that we can create more local zero uh, carbon emissions um, electricity right here in Concord. So for the city, I don't think they would call that a downshift. I think they would say this is the cost of doing business because we have committed to uh, zero emissions. Thank you. Representative Parshall was recognized for a question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for your testimony, Representative McWilliams. Um, can you speak a bit to uh, how you view this as, uh, would it stabilize our, would it, um, would it improve our grid stability in New England, or do you think it would be, have any effect at all? Well, grid stability is a great question because we've all been following Texas, I'm sure, um, with another deep freeze happening and folks losing the ability to uh, control their own heat and, um, losing power in Texas, right? So grid stability, um, comparing New England to Texas is a, a very different animal um, because we are, as I mentioned, we are all under the ISO New England grid. 
Uh, so the reality is um, we have stability in the New England grid because we have diverse sources of energy, including hydro, solar, nuclear, and natural gas. We're not reliant on just one type of fuel. And we also have um, different weather than Texas, right? So we, we make sure that things don't freeze. We've built things to be rated so that when it gets really cold, like it does in New England, and when we have ice storms, uh, we won't lose power unless obviously a tree falls on transmission lines. That happens. And then we have an immediate response uh, to address that because that's the market that we're in. Um, so in terms of stability, um, I would say that adding additional sources to the mix is always a good thing. Um, certainly as government officials, we are always looking at the worst case scenario because we have to worry about those what ifs. Um, you know, the big fear that there might be some kind of an attack on our grid from an outside source is always a, a real concern. Um, <clears throat> so as we move forward with the new era of renewables in New England, talking about things like microgrids, which are self-contained and can continue producing energy, like the, um, the Durham campus, UNH Durham, where they're looking to do a microgrid that's self-contained. So even if there were an incident attack on the grid, they would still be able to contain that specific area with their own production and still continue producing. It's like its own um, generator, basically, but we're talking about not a fossil fuel generator, but renewable generation. Um, so big picture using batteries and renewable technology, I think we're getting closer to diversifying our mix and therefore concerns about grid stability are lessened. But obviously we can't say that for the entire state, right? We still, we heard plenty of testimony yesterday about how New Hampshire is uh, an interesting state because we have these dense municipal areas in the southern portion of the state. And then we are certainly very rural with vast open tracts of land north of the notch. And so when we talk about grid stability, there still is the very real concern that not everyone is stable and depending on weather or um, national incidents or local incidents, um, there's no guarantee or promise. So I would say that adding renewables to the mix as a general rule is a good thing. Um, it gives us more diversity and with batteries, it gives us more opportunity to run in a microgrid manner. Um, but this bill isn't really about microgrids. This bill is about enabling large solar to happen privately um, <coughs> beyond just municipal developments here in New Hampshire so we can keep up with our neighbors and also so we can have energy independence and do homegrown solar. Follow up. No follow up. Uh, Representative Lewicki is recognized for a question. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Representative. I have two questions, um, and I don't know the answers, so these are not, in my mind, leading questions. One is, and recognizing the synergy between solar and air conditioning in the summer, that's one piece, but what do we get from solar on a day like this in terms of percentage of the maximum capacity? Sure, um, <laughs> this is one of the challenges with renewables, right? The sun isn't always shining. Uh, so working with batteries, that would be a time when you'd be drawing from your solar battery instead of obviously on an overcast day where it's basically raining sideways. Uh, you're not gonna be getting any solar produced. Um, but the idea here is that we're diversifying the grid. So we've created something additional to add um, and store for the, those times of peak demand. So it's not just about we have energy when the sun is shining. It is we collect energy when the sun is shining so that it can be reintroduced back through batteries when it is not like today. Okay, and second question is, um, are there any major hydro sites that haven't been exploited? I believe that the Amoskeg Falls is 16 megawatts. Don't quote me on that. Um, and are we likely to find hydro sites that will be in the megawatts or are those all dammed and already producing power? You're asking about new hydro sites as opposed to existing. I'm not aware of, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. Um, I've certainly heard from hydro producers who would be interested in, in being able to take advantage of this bill who are not connected with municip municipalities, but they're existing sites. Um, so I, my lack of knowledge doesn't mean that there isn't one, I'm just not aware of it. Thank you. Uh, further questions, Representative Pimentel is recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Representative, for taking my questions. Um, if someone, if a company wanted to build a 4.99 megawatt array right now, what are their options for selling their, electric, their excess electricity now 
And how does that compare to uh, what would happen if your bill was passed? So right now, when you do a development in New Hampshire that's larger than one megawatt, you have to have a dedicated off taker. So in rare instances where you have a very large user, it still makes sense to pull the trigger and do that because you're going to be producing for yourself or the large user who's nearby. So an example of that would be a huge manufacturing facility who's decided that it makes sense to put solar panels on the roof of their warehouse because they want to have more than one megawatt in order to offset their use. It, it's a business decision. Um, <coughs> when it comes to utilities as an off taker, you could potentially still put in your 4.99 megawatt system and get on the wait list for the utility to do an analysis and determine if there's a hookup potential and what the cost of the hookup is but you wouldn't be actually getting the benefit of spinning the meter backwards beyond the one megawatt that we currently have. So from a business perspective, it doesn't make sense to look at going back to the utility. You would have to be looking to go to a private source, or I'm sorry, a private off taker. Do you need a follow up? Go ahead. So um, you, we would have to basically sell your el excess electricity to someone else as opposed to back to the utility? Is that what I understand? Yes, that's correct. Um, and in, in larger scale, you know, we have Midwestern renewable sources like wind um, that sell their electricity to users in New England, right? You can purchase electricity from an alternative source beyond just our utilities. And so that kind of a plan where you can have a large solar array or a large wind farm that sells energy across the nation to consumers who want to be purchasing renewables. That exists now, but I would say that the market in New Hampshire is not really set up for that because there isn't that additional benefit of spinning the meter backwards when it goes into the utility. Okay, uh, Representative Platt is recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mm -hmm. Thank you for taking my question. You mentioned that uh, if you go to the utility, you may have to have a distribution analysis, essentially, transmission analysis to make sure it fits. And you said that's a good reason to go to a, a business. Wouldn't that distribution analysis still have to take place? Because there may be a constraint on the distribution or transmission system? That's a great point, um, Representative Platt. Whenever you're creating a large amount of energy, you have to make sure that the off taker is capable of receiving it. So that may include upsizing the transmission lines um, or upgrading the entire grid between wherever the energy is being produced and the receiver. Um, so there is a construction cost to upgrade, uh, regardless of whether it's a private or a utility off taker. Uh, Representative McGee is recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking my question. So uh, I, I appreciate you giving the history. I was there for, for it, but um, I, I think my question is around, it appears to me that this bill is designed to help us with a transition so that there, there's an economic support for people being able to invest as they might otherwise, but they wouldn't be getting credit for the energy they're producing. So. Um, can you say a little bit about the, in, the intent of the bill in terms of the, re, the retail energy market here in New Hampshire? Because I think we, we have a lot of conversations back and forth about what we think about that market. But when I look at this bill, I see us struggling to try and put in something a little more systemic rather than just scattershot, which is what we have now in terms of the people who are willing to invest in new technologies. Sure. Um, I, first, I would say that the energy market in New Hampshire wants stability, right? Uh, we, we've already seen this at the PUC with our utilities really demanding to have consistency and stability year over year with what is it that New Hampshire intends to do for long-term mm -hmm. plan. Um, and I think that this bill is part of that goal to provide consistency and stability for the energy market as we ramp up into allowing more than one megawatt for private projects. Mm -hmm. And I say allowing because the business case wouldn't work otherwise. Um, so really, uh, I think the intent here is to ease us into the next step in our energy transition to open up to large scale renewables and a larger percentage of our full energy mix in New Hampshire coming from local sources. And follow up? Follow up? While I have the mic. 
Um, and, and so, uh, again, we also have a conversation downstream from that is if we implement this, then uh, there will be perhaps costs somewhere along <laughs> the chain. And um, uh, if you could say something about whether or not you think having this type of competition would ultimately bring costs down uh, or how it would bring costs down so that people could maybe better understand uh, the intent of that portfolio diversification. Sure. Um, so big picture, we talked about some initial startup costs and the expectation that um, for municipalities and for consumers, there would be an uptick in cost in the short term. Um, but over the long term, we know that we would then become more competitive with our neighboring states. Now, as, as we all know, we're all part of the big bathtub that is ISO New England. So every state has their own energy mix and every state determines uh, differently how that cost is transferred to the consumer. Uh, but big picture, the more energy we produce here in New Hampshire, the more local energy with less transmission distance, the cheaper it's going to be for everyone who, who participates, every off taker. So unless you are completely off grid, you're going to have an electric bill. And that electric bill is comprised of the mix of energy that is being sent to your specific, um, let's say it's a residence, your specific home is receiving a mix of energy and that cost is sent to you based on, uh, as we've talked about in other hearings, the transmission cost is significant when it's coming from far away. That transmission cost could be significantly decreased when we create our own New Hampshire solar and our own New Hampshire wind. So this is really intended to move us forward for the next 10 years and slowly decrease those transmission costs as well as the overall cost of energy when we're seeing huge fluctuations in the international market for natural gas and we're all paying the cost for that this winter. Even if we're not heating with electricity, we're still seeing our electric bills go up significantly because natural gas is a volatile market. So what we're looking to do is introduce stability with um, local solar and wind that is not so volatile um, and based on other factors like wars and shipping overseas and things like that. Representative Plett has a question. In the bill, you refer to a default rate, energy rate, uh, that, that the uh, PUC shall apply. I'm looking for the precise words. It's hard to be clerk and uh, ask questions at the same time. Uh, but but uh, isn't that locking the, uh, uh, the PUC into something? Uh, yeah, it, it's a uh, page three, line 16, uh, 18 rather, uh, et cetera. And isn't that locking the PUC into something that may, the PUC in its judgment may decide is in fact a, 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 an unreasonable cost shift? So I'm not going to speak for the PUC. <laughs> um, I think that may be a decision for the PUC to make. Uh, but when we talk default energy rate, that can change. That's not locked in stone. So. Uh, what it is today is not necessarily what it'll be next year on the same day. Okay, do you need a follow-up? No, okay. Uh, Representative Thomas is recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I'm just curious, could you refer to the page three, uh, line three? Could you explain to us uh, exactly why that paragraph is there and why it's important or not? The version of the bill I'm looking at doesn't have the line numbers. Could you just read the first text? Oh, I'm sorry. So I'm on okay, the same so it's it's uh, subparagraph E, uh, which uh, paragraph E. Uh, I'm sorry, paragraph three, Roman numeral seven, subparagraph E. It talks about the um, any provisions of settlement agreements or orders that have been approved or issued by the commission, uh, blah blah blah, uh, shall not apply, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that paragraph there. Could you explain why that's in there and why is that, uh, that's important? I'm going to read it out loud for the record. Any provisions of settlement agreements or orders that have been approved or issued by the Commission that relate to a distribution utilities treatment of the output from qualifying facilities or independent power producers shall not apply to the output from an eligible customer generator participating in net metering. Uh, so we've had some pretty long discussions about what happens when somebody installs solar panels on their house and they decide that they don't want to take advantage of the RECs. 
and uh, rec sweeping is when those recs go to the utility without any additional payment to the person who installed the solar. So it's basically a free gift to the utilities. Um, what I'm seeing here is that somebody gets the benefit of the net metering as opposed to the recs which go uh, immediately to the utility. So it looks like um, qualifying facilities or independent pr producers will be treated differently than utilities when it comes to net metering. So perhaps when we're talking about um, a utility who is receiving uh, energy directly from a producer, right? Someone who's decided to do a 4.99 megawatt huge uh, solar array. It's going directly to the utility and so they are net metering because they're sending it to the utility and there's a specific rate that the utility will give them for producing that energy, right? Especially if it's positive net metering as opposed to being used for their own use. But if you're doing an independent power producer, that would be a different rate altogether because they're using it for their own use rather than sending it back to the, to the grid for the utility's use. Follow up? Uh, thank you. Um, well, you probably explained why, uh, what that paragraph means. I'm not exactly sure I understand why it needs to be in there, but my follow-up question is, uh, uh, and, you, and you mentioned rec, uh, rec sweeping. Would this prevent rec sweeping? So it doesn't say the word renewable energy credit. But I, I think that this is something that could be amended to either make it very clear that it's intended to be rec sweeping or not. I think this is more about laying out the ground rules for how the rate is applied, whether it's used locally or sent back to the utility. But I do think that looking at rec sweeping um, as a, a layer added to uh, local solar production is important. We've addressed it with several other bills we've talked about this year. I'm not sure that that's a, an animal that I'd want to add into this bill at this time, but it's something to consider. Okay, thank you. Okay, additional questions. I have one, uh, then we'll see if uh, Representative Bernardi and Kelly Pitts have questions. My question is, um, could you describe how this bill differs from the three net metering bills that were vetoed by the governor since 2019? Well, <laughs> at this point, municipal has been approved by the governor, so it doesn't include municipal. It's really just private. Um, so in that case, we've kind of split the baby, right? We passed municipal, the governor signed it, it's happening now, and municipal slowly ramping up. I think we'll actually hear, hear from the Department of Energy about some information and data on municipal net metering as the program continues to grow. Um, but this bill is really focused on those who were left behind. Uh, so I would say that this is half of a bill compared to a full bill the last three times the governor saw it. Um, and so I guess the ask is, uh, all right, we've left these portions of the industry behind. Let's allow them to catch up. Let's give them the same um, benefits that we've given our municipalities. And that's the difference. Okay, thank you. And my follow-up question would be, I have looked at the remote network service transmission tables for all the New England states, and I don't see that New Hampshire pays any increase in transmission costs mm -hmm. over the other states. Why do you think that that happens? Or why do you think that that's true, the statement you made about New Hampshire paying more in transmission costs? So I would be careful to say that we don't pay more in transmission costs than the states around us. I would simply say that because we are receiving um, much of our energy, not our nuclear, but much of our other energy from out of state, we are paying those transmission costs because they're coming to us from elsewhere. So in order to reduce that, we would need to have local sources of energy to not be paying the transmission costs. So it's not really a Massachusetts, Maine, Vermont versus New Hampshire for transmission cost comparison. It is a, we all get energy from other places via natural gas pipelines, et cetera, hydro from Canada. And so we're paying those transmission costs, but we can reduce them, all of us, uh, individually and uh, specifically for New Hampshire by having local energy that is not brought from so far away. Thank you. Representative Bernardi is recognized for a question. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Rep. Uh, Williams. Uh, Could so you get a little bit closer to so your mic? So my record? question is more, Thank you. more fundamental, uh, which is why is this necessary 
if there is a desire, as you've indicated, for individuals and businesses to purchase solar, wind, hydropower, um, energy now, why, why can't they find the users they need and build their, build their uh, three, five, four megawatt systems? Um, so that's really a question of the market. Uh, we certainly have developers who would like to do that work in New Hampshire and are choosing to do it in the surrounding states instead because there is this additional incentive to do projects up to 4.99 megawatts in the states surrounding New Hampshire. We do not have those incentives or, or the things that move the market, and so the businesses are choosing not to put in their own money and take somewhat of a loss in the short term because they can make more money where the low-hanging fruit is in the surrounding states. So unless and until the surrounding states are completely coated and covered with every possible site, I don't see New Hampshire as being an opportune location because we don't have the same market conditions as the states around us. But we can by passing this bill. This creates that additional incentive to spin the meter backwards between the one and 4.99 megawatt window. And so what we're talking about is a major market shift. We as government actors are able to change the market by passing legislation to encourage a direction that we'd like to see the market to go. And so expecting private actors in a difficult condition to act that way is not realistic. We know that in capitalism, these contractors are going to select the lowest hanging fruit, which in this case is generally Massachusetts, but it can also be Maine and Vermont. It's certainly not New Hampshire for large solar. Follow up? Yes. So uh, then you're saying that we, we have to have these incentives or because, because these customers aren't out there, they can't find them, uh, even in Massachusetts or, or Vermont or, or Maine? So I'm talking about shifting the entire market, right? We're, we're, we're making a major change in how we put energy into the New Hampshire market by incentivizing large solar and large wind and large hydro. So incentivizing those is a market shift that shift has already occurred in Massachusetts, Maine, and Vermont, and so we're seeing more and more medium-sized to large-sized arrays pop up in those locations because the market has shifted there but not here. So we are, in effect, being left behind. So it's not so much that there isn't a need or a desire. I will tell you that I personally purchased my electricity from 100% wind outside of my Unitil contract because I want to do the right thing for the next generation and for the long term. But I would probably say that that's not something that most people in New Hampshire even consider. They're really just looking at what is my cost of electricity and is there any way I can reduce it, right? So when we're talking about making a market shift, the goal here is let's get more homegrown electricity. Let's make it here in New Hampshire. Let's be proud of something that we can do and let's create that market. Um, so it's not that there isn't the desire. It's simply that at such a large scale, you're not going to see independent actors making much of a difference for a drop in the bucket. Okay, thank you. Representative Callie Pitts has a question. Oh, she passed. I'll pass for now. Okay, she passes. All right. Representative Lewicki has a question. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Um, it's kind of a parallel question. Um, you've mentioned batteries. And before we can reduce either base load or transmission, then we would need to have the renewables be able to store enough energy to uh, ride through whatever time that might be, because otherwise we're still going to just revert to base load. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I agree. Was that a question? <laughs> I agree. No, are, are, the I would how, <laughs> are the batteries, how big are the batteries? How long can they yeah. last? Sure. Um, so there have been some really interesting pilot studies on large-scale batteries in Massachusetts. I believe this is on the South Shore near the Cape. Um, so these are like, if you look at um, an 18-wheeler that has the big old box on the back of it, right, that you can move around, we're talking about that size full of batteries that can contain enough to run for two or three days for, you know, 10 or 20 houses. So what we're doing is creating a box with batteries that can run during a complete electric shutdown for a couple of days for a neighborhood. Um, and that's not so far away right now in terms of technology. 
Um, and I certainly would like to get some more information on the UNH Durham project because I believe it's a similar concept of we want to be completely self-contained and able to run even if it's a snowstorm for three days, the sky is gray. We want to be able to draw from our backup. Okay, follow-up? Follow-up? Um, thank you. Um, we're talking, I'm just kind of trying to mix, take oranges and oranges. So if we have a five megawatt um, solar facility, how big would the battery have to be to be able to ride through several days? Because that's a whole lot more than 20 houses. Sure. Um, I, I don't actually play solar developer on TV. Um, so I, there may be some folks in this room who have a little bit more information than me on the actual scale. But it would be that size of, you know, a semi-trailer truck box times however many are necessary to provide the planned backup for the scale of the solar. I, I can't tell you exactly whether that's a quarter acre or a half acre compared to the full array, but there's some math for the amount of time and duration that you intend to have a backup for. And just to spin off that question, I also think that here in New England, we are not doing ourselves any favors by not doing time of use um, costing because obviously when the solar is happening in the middle of the day and we're getting a lot of solar energy into the grid that could be stored in batteries, that's the cheapest electricity. It's in the evenings when everyone comes home and they're doing a load of laundry and the dishes and turn up the electric heat for those folks who have it. That's the time of use when there's real demand. And Let's so confine we this discussion to the bill okay. in question. Thank you. Representative <laughs> Merner is uh, recognized for a question. Yes. Uh, Recently, we just um, there was a big scale project up in Littleton proposed, with, and it was rejected by the town because they just didn't understand it because they were over 30 megawatt uh, storage, and so uh, Representative Harrington filed a bill to make it a separate class so that the site evaluation committee can actually sit in, you know, be part of the process for them to get this to get it through. Um, so. I mean, it's being looked at, and that was the first big scale one I know in the state of New Hampshire that was filed. So, um, so it, it, we have, they are looking at it because that will take that what you're talking about the instability out. Thank you. I'm going to suggest at this point that we move on. We have three more people s signed up to testify on this bill. We're uh, down to our last 22 minutes or so. Representative McWilliams has done an outstanding job. Uh, of explaining what the bill does, how it manipulates the market, et cetera. So let's move on, and I'd like to uh, thank you, Representative McWilliams. Thank I'd you like all. To, I'd like to call on uh, Mark Brown of the Consumer Energy Alliance. Good morning, Mr. Brown. It's all yours. Good morning. Good to, good to be back before the committee in person. Um, Chairman Vose, members of the committee, uh, for the record, my name is Mark Brown. I am the Executive Director of New England for Consumer Energy Alliance. CEA is a nationwide association made up of both energy producers and consumers, working to advance in all the above energy and environmental policies that will lower energy costs for everyone. CEA supports actions that thoughtfully advance our nation toward a cleaner, more environmentally responsible energy future, um, while also considering the needs of consumers. So on behalf of CEA, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify here today. Um, CEA supports New Hampshire families, municipalities, businesses making investments in generation that will allow them to produce their own power and sell that power back to the grid. There is no legislative or regulatory hurdle prohibiting this from happening now. Um, as is always the case with these bills, the issue is that what compensation. You know, for systems one to five megawatts, uh, PERP requires utilities to purchase their power at avoided cost. So there, you know, there is a market there for that now. Um, so I just want to just touch on that now. Um, the other thing I want to talk about is you often hear about, um, and I think Representative McWilliams brought it up, is about this transmission cost savings. Um, I passed around a sheet there, and it's not, it, it shouldn't be seen as anything that's, you know, totally conclusive because um, there's a lot that goes into transmission costs. But if you look at the, it's a 12-month rolling average of, you know, regional load, okay, and this goes month to month. 
and it's from December of 2014 through December 2021. Um, you can't see it on the on the on the graph that I sent out, but if you look at let's start at the top with Massachusetts, you know you go all the way to the left in December 14. Uh, their allocation was 46.2 percent of the re, you know of regional transmission. By December 21, you know it's 45.7 percent. So keep in mind the transmission market is about two. It's about a two billion dollar market. So each each tenth of a percentage point represents two million dollars. Okay. So in theory, Massachusetts would be saving uh, 10 million dollars in annual transmission costs. Right. If you if you look at it that way, Connecticut starts out at 25.3 and goes down to 24.4. New Hampshire 9.4 and goes up to 9.7. Now again, this isn't meant to be you know definitive or absolute or anything like that, but it's pretty clear that you know Massachusetts has spent literally in that time frame tens of billions of dollars on behind the meter and energy efficiency and things to you know reduce load, um, and they haven't really substantially reduced their transmission costs. Um, during that time frame. So I think that's, you know, I think this is somewhat illus illustrative of, of what might happen um, or what is happening, probably. Um, you know, I'm not, I've sat before this committee before and I've talked about studies and I'm happy to provide the committee with any studies that I referenced today. And, but there's, there's plenty of studies out there that show that net metering policies are socially regressive, that non-adopters pay for more of the, you know, the distribution system than solar adopters do. Solar adopters tend to be more wealthy than non-solar adopters. You know, 2021 Lawrence Berkeley lab study, uh, I think the average medium income for a typical solar owner was $113,000, where I think the U.S. average is around $64,000, so that's a pretty substantial difference. That has come down. I think in 2010, the, the average solar owner had an income of about 140, median income of about $140,000. Um, so we know, you know, we know it's, it's pretty socially regressive. Um, you know, Massachusetts has, puts into its tariffs, you know, low income adders um, to offset the cost in Massachusetts of the behind the meter um, systems. Um, I think it's probably exceeding over $100 million now. Um, so I want to talk about a few things about markets. So th this would this would create a, a you know this would compensate systems at one to five megawatts at the default service rate, which we know is well above market rates even with um, you know the price of natural gas on the rise right now. Uh, we've passed legislation for community you know for community power, community choice aggregation, however you want to look at it. That should create a market for larger systems. You know more towns adopting. You know, increasing you know, green programs, m more net zero, more 100% renewable, that should develop the market for these size for these size systems. Um, as far as you know, tr again, kind of flipping back to transmission costs. You know, New Hampshire, we are uh, we are part of a regional grid, as Representative McWilliams stated. Um, but if you look at it strictly from you know energy produced and energy consumed, electricity produced and energy consumed as far as in terms of megawatt hours, well then New Hampshire would be considered actually a net exporter of energy. So you know between the, the nuclear plants, between Granite Ridge and Londonderry, between you know the hydros and the and the wind and and, and the solar, we produce more electricity in the state than we actually consume. Um, so just wanted to touch on that. Um, so, you know, I think, um, I think with that, I'll, I guess I'll just conclude my testimony. I'll be happy to take any questions. Um, and again, if anybody wants to, I'll be happy to forward any studies. Um, there are, you know, MIT, Stanford, Cal Berkeley, um, pretty conclusive studies that show that expanding net metering is socially regressive, so. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Representative Plett has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question. Mr. Brown, you say we're a net exporter of energy. Would installing more uh, net metering local facilities increase that net export and therefore increase the need for transmission? I mean, that, uh, that's dependent on what other states do. And you, I mean, you, you, it's, it's complicated, right? It's not, it's not that simple. Um, it depends on what happens in the market, you know. Um, yeah, the, the, I guess what I would say is the more we f 
incentivize, you know, through state policies, other resources. It's going to uh, create price suppression on existing resources like nuclear plants that rely heavily on energy market revenue, not capacity market revenue. And, you know, it would potentially put those plants at risk. I know, you know, when Vermont, when Vermont Yankee retired in, I think it was 2014, 2015, there are a host of reasons why it retired. But one of the reasons they gave was they were concerned about what was going to happen with energy markets down the road and potential price suppression effects and thus their revenue from state policies. You know, immediately after that, emissions rose, I think it was 7% in the next year after they retired. So uh, I think there's a kind of a bigger picture here. I, and I know I didn't fully answer your question, but I think it's more complicated than just saying if we, if we install a bunch of five megawatt systems in New Hampshire, well then we're gonna create, you know, transmission problems. It could, you know, it could, especially if, let's say Seabrook were to retire. Well, now you're really moving power, you know, from other areas, you know, into New Hampshire. We already know there's congestion constraints on the mass, on the, excuse me, on the Maine New Hampshire border. So even if you bring hydro in from Canada through Maine, there's got to be infrastructure built to carry that power into New Hampshire. So it's more complicated than just a, I think, a yes or no. Follow up. Follow up. Yes. Um, there's been testimony about desirability of local generation. Um, I gave testimony the other day about a situation in my town. Uh, trash to energy, people hated the idea, but it was okay in Maine, so we shipped our tra trash to Maine. I is it, is it, uh, is, so is it the eye of the beholder, whether d local generation is desirable or not? Yeah, and I think that applies to any, any resource. It doesn't matter, you know, you're seeing solar projects rejected in towns like Northampton, Massachusetts. They don't want to see any, you know, large-scale solar projects. So you're seeing it in Maine. Um, I think Lovell, Maine is the town. Um, you know, we've seen it with wind. We've seen it with transmission lines, you know. Um, so you, there, you, you call it nimbyism, call it whatever you want. But, yeah, there's, gonna, there's probably going to be opposition to, you know, to anything. Uh, Representative Nodder is recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking the question, Mr. Brown. Good to see you again. Good to see you. Um, I keep hearing the word incentivize, but what do you mean exactly by that? Does, does it mean re redistribution of wealth? Well, I think, th I do believe, th you know, that net metering is regressive. So yes, it is, I do believe it, it generally favors the, the more wealthy and at the expense of those less fortunate. Um, and I think that the evidence shows that. Um, and as far as incentives go, you know, this bill would incentivize, it would make payments to systems from one up to, you know, 4.9999 megawatts to avoid FERC jurisdiction um, above market rates. So that's, you know, and above the, the PERPA prescribed avoid a cost rate, which in New Hampshire is pretty much the, the LMP, so. Uh, Representative McGee is recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Brown, for taking my question. Um, it's an interesting conversation we're having, and it always comes down to, you know, which points we're being asked to look at. Um, in, in your graph here, it's a rolling average of regional load, and I guess my initial question I have to would be, is regional load based on uh, populations and industry that yeah. the state serves? It's based on peak. It's based on monthly peaks. Just peaks. Those are monthly peaks. And those peaks are not related to the population use? No, it's transmission peaks. Just so transmission. Yeah. Okay. All right. And then the second thing is the point on socially uh, regressive, I think, you know, I think that the, the bill in looking at diversity is saying we don't have a plan here in New Hampshire, right? We don't have an understanding of where we're going in terms of Seabrook and, you know, so all of this is speculation in terms of what is the mix going to be in 10 years? We don't have a plan that tells us where we're going. And I think on the question of socially regressive that you were trying to make, um, my understanding is that it, it's not socially regressive if you are trying to take into account the climate effects that disproportionately affect the poor. So I think it is looking at what is socially regressive in terms of our energy decisions to try and uh, put policies in place that help prevent those in the lower income rungs from being affected by the decisions we're making today on our energy. 
Um, okay, well, those are, you know, probably difficult to quantify. Um, I would say, you know, from a, an emissions perspective, especially with CO2, one, I, in New Hampshire has the lowest emissions per megawatt hour produced in the region, largely due to Seabrook. Yep. You know, but it's a fact nonetheless. The U.S. itself has reduced emissions by about 17 percent uh, between 2005 and 2019, so we're, we're kind of leading the world in that area. Um, we're exporting emissions to some extent to other countries that are less environmentally responsible than we are. So I would say, you know, uh, there's trade-offs to any policy. Um, when I talk about socially regressive, you know, you look at a, a lot of the studies have been done in states that have far more advanced, you know, renewable energy policies than New mm -hmm. Hampshire, Massachusetts, California, obviously a lot of studies have been done there, um, Illinois. Um, but it does show significant cost shifts from generally solar adopters to non-solar adopters. And we've seen, you know, as, as in the case with California, they're importing a lot of power from Arizona, which is heavily dependent on coal. Um, they're building new gas plants to, you know, the LA County is building a new gas plant to support its municipal system because they need the reliability there. So there's a lot of trade-offs. So I would just say that, uh, you know, yeah, there may be benefits on this end, and there's definitely benefits to the recipient of the net metering program, but there's a lot of other factors that you need to look at as well. So, and there's some evidence to show that it's, it's not good for everybody. Thank you. Representative Somsich is recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your testimony, Mr. Brown. Um, I'm kind of surprised by some of your, your comments uh, because we have had numerous testimony and uh, documents provided to us by DES here at this committee over the past two or three years who have consistently said that transmission costs are rising compared to the other neighboring states. They've said this over and over again. They've documented it. It's in our four-year energy strategy plan. Uh, are you saying that they're wrong? I'm saying that if you pick an arbitrary beginning point, then you can come up with any, you know, you can kind of show anything you want to show. And what I would say is, you know, <coughs> it's not just about the, tr it shouldn't be looked at as just the transmission costs. What did it cost to reduce those, those transmission numbers? You know, again, Massachusetts has spent tens of billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars on distributed generation and energy efficiency to move the needle slightly. So, you know, just saying that, oh, well, you know, our, 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 our share of the regional network load is up a little bit, or even if it's up a full point, okay, well, if, if Massachusetts is spending more money than it is saving, then it doesn't make a lot of sense to do it. Follow up. Follow up. Uh, and, um, you know, we're talking about the, the, the uh, future perspective of energy supply in New Hampshire. Um, how do you see the impact of the offshore wind industry, which probably will be impacting us within the next 10 years on the energy prices that people, that uh, New Hampshire will be paying, or New England for that matter? I think that offshore wind is promising, but it, you know, it needs to provide benefits to the consumer as well. And if those contracts are for, you know, firm power at reasonable rates, great, you know, but if, you know, if it's going to be for intermittent power where you're managing risk and, and all that sort of thing and it increased costs on the other side, uh, you know, th I think it, the, the proof is in the pudding. Is there, is there potential in offshore wind? Absolutely. I'm not going to argue that with you at all, I, but I do think it a lot depends on how the contracts are structured and, um, you know, obviously how the projects are developed and what capacity factors those projects are going to have. Um, that's all st things that are going to matter. But I'm, I'm not going to argue the, the potential benefits of offshore wind with you here. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Representative Bernardi is recognized for a question. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, uh, Mr. Brown. Uh, as you've noted, uh, net metering incentives means increased costs to the consumers. Uh, do you have an estimate uh, for this bill, what, we're, what, what kind of increased costs we'd be looking at? I, I, I mean, I could sit down and do some back of the envelope math, but no. And I think this actually, you bring up a good point because 
look, the, the DOE, I guess now is, you know, th we're waiting for a study uh, to be completed that has been part of an ongoing docket at the PUC, you know, uh, the net metering tariff docket, 16-576. Uh, and there's a study that's going to be coming uh, out of that. I think it's supposed to be late spring. And I think it would do, do us all good to put pause on some of these net metering bills, to, to wait to see what that study shows. It may not, again, it's not probably going to be conclusive. It's not going to be, you know, probably, oh, yeah, you have to do this or, or, or whatever. But it should provide us with more information as to what the impact of net metering is on New Hampshire right now and will better inform us down the road um, on policies. Again, it, it, some of us may agree or disagree with whatever the study shows, but at least we'll have more information to go, to go by. Okay, thank you. With that, I'm going to uh, call on the, uh, I'm going to thank Mr. Brown for his very informative testimony and call on the next uh, presenter who will be our good friend Griffin Roberge from the Department of Energy. By the way, uh, we're running out of time that was allocated for this public hearing, so I will be starting the next public hearing promptly at 10 o'clock and then recessing it until we finish this public hearing. So, Mr. Robarge, it's all yours. Thank you, uh, Chairman Vos, members of the committee. Uh, for the record, Griffin Roberge from the Depar New Hampshire Department of Energy, uh, here to respectfully oppose House Bill 1596. Um, it's largely for two reasons that have been discussed. Um, as noted in the fiscal note, and as Mr. Brown uh, just said moments ago, um, the department is currently working on it uh, with a consultant to study issues related to the value of distributed energy resources um, in the state. Um, that study is meant to provide policymakers, state agencies, as well as other stakeholders some type of guidance as to the value of these resources that, are, that is New Hampshire-centric, using New Hampshire-centric data. Um, it is part of an ongoing PUC docket, and again, for reference, it's DE. 16-576, um, and it is expected that that study will be completed in late spring of this year. Um, the department just thinks that this bill is premature at this time, pending the outcome of that study. While um, this bill would largely expand net metering, uh, you know, to the extent that there may or may not be cost shifting, this bill would likely exaggerate that. I think the department would like to see what the study has to. Uh, ultimately finds um, in that direction. Um, as I know, the committee is certainly well aware. Um, House Bill 315 was signed into law last year, um, along with other language in Senate Bill 91 um, that had a very targeted and modest uh, increase beyond the one megawatt net metering cap for municipal hosts. It allows um, public private entities to net meter for the benefit of political subdivision or I should say group net meter for the benefit of political subdivisions uh, to date there are currently four municipal hosts in the state registered um, there's one in their all all four hydroelectric facilities but they're located in Milton Berlin Gorham and Hillsborough I couldn't give any ideas to what type of applications might come in the future but that's a currently uh, what is in operation for municipal hosts in the state. Uh, certainly willing to answer any questions that the committee might have. Um, and that concludes my testimony. Thank you for uh, excellent testimony on this bill. Questions for Mr. Roberge, uh, <coughs> Representative Somsich. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Roberge, for coming. Um, my understanding is that we've had several documents and testimonies from PUC as well as from other agencies who said that in light of our very low penetration of renewable energy in this state, there is no observable cost shifting that we could see up to this point. Would you agree with that? I believe that there was, and it put me on the spot, I can't remember the docket number or the, the document or anything like that right now, but I think there was some years ago there was a conclusion that there wasn't any noticeable effect of cost shifting based on the data at that time. And mm -hmm. I believe that was three, four years ago or something like that. Again, doing this all from memory and I'll certainly follow up by email. Um, but again, 
st st uh, factors certainly change over time, that's for certain. Um, and so that's why uh, the department would respectfully li like to request um, further study on this issue with the study that's expected out in late spring to get further information as to the true value of these distributed energy resources and its impact on the state. Follow up. Follow up? Uh, yes. Could you, do you have any ideas? I, I agree with you. I think it was three or four years ago that we heard this. Something like that. Well, how much, what, what kind of increase have we seen in renewable energy since that three, four years since then? Sure, so obviously. That would make a difference, perhaps. I obviously, there is the renewable portfolio standard. Um, that's the state's renewable energy uh, policy tool that encourages the, uh, or I should say incentivizes and encourages the development of renewable energies in the state every year that goes by. Uh, various class obligations increase over time. So off the top of my head, that's certainly one that encourages the further development of renewable energy resources in the state. Um, obviously, there was the passage of the municipal host bill last year. That's obviously encouraged at least four projects to come online in group net meter for the benefit of municipalities and their local property taxpayers. Um, I couldn't offer anything substantial, but you know, in terms of renewable energy and maybe its expansion, I'm sure it will likely be discussed in the study that comes out later this year. Excuse me, that was not my question. I, I asked you whether or not how, how much has changed in the last three or four years? You were saying there are all these incentives in place to do things, but I wanted to know how much has changed since then to change the opinion, maybe, of what we heard three years ago. Oh, of the study. Um, yeah. You know, obviously there's been a targeted increase with municipal hosts. Again, as I said, um, certainly market factors are, are also a thing to take into consideration. I couldn't comment substantially. You know, I'm not involved uh, intricately in the study and what it's currently looking at, but um, I can certainly, f you know, try to get you a more concrete answer and follow up with you okay. offline. Thank you very much. We do know that install solar has doubled in that time period. Uh, I'm going to take a quick pause here and I'm going to open the public hearing on House Bill 1599-FN and then I'm going to recess that public hearing until we complete this public hearing, which hopefully won't take too much longer. Uh, more questions for Mr. Roberge, Representative Callie Pitts. Hi, Cambridge. Mr. Uh, Roberge, if I, as a private citizen, wanted to put up a 4.99 megawatt solar array and had to connect that array to the grid, the transmission grid, who would pick up the cost for that? Would it be me or would it be the company or would it be split? How would that be funded? If a private entity were to construct a, a system in excess of one megawatt. Um, you know, I, I met obviously the cost will be borne by that private entity obviously installing the system and all of its relevant aspects. In terms of upgrading, you know, a distribution system or transmission system, I'd have to do a deeper dive, but I anticipate that those costs would likely be imposed upon uh, the utility, which would then be shared amongst its ratepayers for probably cost recovery, but again, like to do a deeper dive and not lead you astray with an incorrect answer. Follow up? I I'm, I, I'm having a hard time hearing you, so that's... Um, one of my concerns, and I don't know if the Department of Energy would look into this or if departments cross, um, cross areas, but is that if most of the cost is borne by ratepayers, perhaps more people would be more interested in selling electricity than tomatoes. Is that a valid concern? I'm not sure I understand your question. I, I guess you're saying people would be further incentivized to sell electricity rather than sell tomatoes using your analogy? Your, or your reference? Of yes, that? and that electricity, if it goes out onto the grid, can go anywhere. It doesn't have to stay, in my mind, uh, what I understand, in New Hampshire. No, and, and, and that's true, but obviously if people net meter, it tends to be 
for the benefit of those largely in the surrounding area, as I think you're well aware, you know, the longer, the longer uh, in distance electricity needs to travel, you know. The more expensive it is. Yes, becomes. correct. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Representative McGee is recognized. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Robash, for taking my question. Um, I, I'm going to refer back to what you said in your opening. You talked about the fact that the DOE is opposed to the bill specifically because there's a pending value of DER study going on at the relatively newly formed DOE. And then you mentioned that there was also a docket opened at the PUC that starts with DE 16. Can you explain to people what that 16 stands for? So, I'm sorry, 16 references um, the year that the docket was created. And so, that so it's, it's six years that, that we've would, been waiting for that. That would work, yes. Right. Thank and, you for and the so clarification. Yes, yeah, so I just wanted to say that for some of us that have been wor you know, working in this field for a while, while- We're asking questions, right. right. While, while you're saying that it's premature, I, I guess I would, I would suggest to you that we've been waiting a really long time for someone to give us a definitive answer. Sure. And, uh, and so um, when you talk about the pending study of the value of DER that's going on at DOE, could you give us an anticipated time frame for when we might be seeing those results? Yeah, late spring of this year. Um, yeah, that's at, that's at least outlined in the fiscal note. That's the anticipated, um, anticipated conclusion of the study. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Robarge, for your testimony. And uh, we'd like to move on now to our final speaker on this uh, Bill, and that is Sam Evans Brown representing Clean Energy New Hampshire. Or did you submit this pink card for the next bill? Uh, that is correct. I was not planning on testifying uh, on this bill. Yeah. Okay. We'll be calling on you shortly then. All right, so that exhausts our pink cards for this bill and uh, uh, concludes basically our discussion or our public hearing on this bill. So I will now close the public hearing on House Bill 1506 uh, and quickly require uh, or ask uh, Representative Pimentel to give us blue sheet information about this bill. While he's fetching that information, what we will do is we will take a five minute bio break and we will return to this room at no later than 10.15 to resume the public hearing on House Bill 1599. Thank so you, Representative Pimentel, what'd you find? Uh, three names are on the blue sheet. All are in favor of the bill. And then on the online version, there were 95 in support three opposed and one neutral. Okay, thank you. We are in uh, recess until 10.15.
I'd like to call 
I'd like to call to order, please. HB 1599. And uh, before we start, I would like to uh, comment that in, in the interest of time, please limit our uh, speakers to about five minutes. And I will be very strict on clarification questions. Any statements made for clarification uh, uh, will be okay, but will be suspended if they become just statements. So please respect that. And I'd like to introduce and welcome Representative Vose to introduce 1599. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chairman. And good uh, uh, morning, actually, I guess it is. Good morning to all my uh, colleagues on the committee. For the record, I'm Representative Michael Vose. I represent Rockingham District 9, the town of Epping, and I'm here to introduce House Bill 1599-FN uh, to the committee. So this bill is a relatively simple bill. It uses language that was actually proposed in a committee of conference last year when we were having deliberations on House Bill 15 and Senate Bill 91. And this language essentially says that if you are a customer generator of renewable energy that engages in net energy metering, you cannot be paid for renewable portfolio standard charges. You cannot be credited, rather, for renewable portfolio uh, standard charges when you are credited for your net metering supply to the grid. It's a fairly simple change, and uh, the language may be PUC speak, <laughs> as they call it, but it uh, does one simple thing, and it just says that if you are a net energy meter, you need to pay your, poor, your fair share of RPS charges and can't receive credits for those charges. It's no more complicated than that and doesn't require a lot of explanation. So with that, I'll open the uh, floor to questions, and we'll go on from there. Uh, Representative um, McGee, you're uh, recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Acting Chairman. Uh, and thank you, Chairman Bose, for taking my question. Um, I guess my question would be, how would this affect the existing uh, participants in the market? It would lower the credit that any net metering customer currently gets. They currently get the default service rate it would essentially subtract from that credit, default service credit, the cost of compliance with the RPS. Okay, and may I follow up? Follow up. And to, to what end though? What is the hope of the bill? The purpose of the bill is to require that net metering customers pay their fair share of the renewable portfolio standard. If they're given a credit when they, for their RPS portion, then they are essentially not paying for their portion of the RPS. That would shift costs onto the rest of us. I only got two questions, right? <laughs> so far. Representative Sonsich, you're recognized for a question with a Q. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Representative Bose. Um, can you clarify for me again, is currently what, what is the current practice if, if you are a customer generator and, and net metering? So you get credit for your, the energy you put into the grid, and you're saying that that portion on your electric bill that is assigned to the RPS, you don't pay that. Is that the current practice? Is that what you're saying? No. I, I, what I said was that if this bill passed, the practice would change. Current well, practice is, yes. Oh, you that's are, what I'm asking. What is the current practice? Yes. If you, if you generate more than 100 kilowatts of electricity and you net meter, you get default service credits for the energy that you put onto the grid. The default service credit includes the cost of the RPS that the utility I must, see. That's included in out. the default service. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Seeing no other questions, I uh, thank uh, Representative Vose uh, for your very informative testimony. 
and I will call on, I'd like to call on a, uh, a public uh, speaker, uh, Mr. Kwasnier, Kwasnick, please come up. Could you turn your mic on, please? And get just a little bit closer. Is it on? Okay. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, the committee for the opportunity to testify on this bill. Uh, my name is Joe Kwasnick, and um, I'm a citizen of Concord, and I'm a founding member of the New Hampshire Network for Environment, Energy, and Climate, which is uh, about a year old, and we're working as a coordinating and um, co communicating function among like groups within New Hampshire. I'm also a former chairman of the New Hampshire Electric Cooperative, and retired environmental executive for National Grid. Um, I am today submitting a written testimony, uh, which I submitted electronically this morning, in opposition to House Bill 1599. My reasons for opposing the bill are as follows, and these reasons are what you've heard uh, on the previous bill today. Um, one is that um, the bill changes the basis for compensation for new customer generators within a total peak generating capacity of greater than one megawatt. The bill states the commission order uh, 26029 from June 23, 2017 shall be applicable except for the cost of compliance with the electrical renewable portfolio standard and a few words after that. Uh, just a, a little bit of history, in June of 2017, the PUC established the current net metering tariffs. In those tariffs, uh, the PUC established its view that the new tariffs avoided any significant cost shifting among and between customer rate classes. Rate classes. Currently, the PUC is studying the value of distributed energy resources, a program called, referred to as a VDER, and would be expected to make any adjustments to the net metering credit tariffs, if necessary, to avoid cost shifting between customer classes. Um, given the current schedule for issuing this report on VDER, now scheduled for the spring of this year, the legislation should wait, this legislation should wait for the PUC to issue its report and recommendations before developing any new legislation in this area. Unilaterally adjusting the various components of credits or debits for net metering, net metering customer generators without the benefit of the upcoming VDR study, it's inappropriate and cannot properly evaluate the benefits and costs of net metering. Let the PUC proceed on developing the VDER study and then act on the conclusions of the study to, as necessary. This, building, this bill is unnecessary and premature. It should be determined to be inexpedient to legislate. You know, prepared to take questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kwasnick. Uh, Representative Pletz, recognized for a question. Thank you. I'm asking this question as clerk. Would you please spell out VDER? Um, VDER is called the Value of Distributed Energy Resources. And my apologies. And I don't. I don't envy your position at all. <laughs> okay, uh, seeing no questions, uh, thank you, Mr. Kwasnick, uh, for your testimony. Appreciate it. And you said that the written testimony was was emailed to us. It was emailed. This okay, morning. very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Next, I'd like to call up um, for real this time, Sam Evans Brown. from Clean Energy New Hampshire. Mr. Sam Evans, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'll try to be brief. I, I think uh, Clean Energy New Hampshire has been engaged in the, the various proceedings at the Public Utilities Commission that set the net metering rates for, for years now. Um, and, and I would say that, generally speaking, we recognize the principle that this bill is based on, um, and it's, it's sound in principle, but the issue is that it's looking simply at one side of the ledger, right? So, so net metering, um, I think even its most resolute proponents uh, would recognize that net metering is, is, a, is a policy that gives rough justice to uh, distributed energy resources. It was not a policy that was designed 
terribly conscientiously or thinking about uh, the markets, the market structures that it was playing into. It was simply the easiest way to roll out distributed energy at a time decades ago in which we did not have a terribly uh, great number of options, technologically speaking, to integrate those resources into the grid. But also it was recognizing that these technologies were, in an, were sort of in an infant stage uh, and we didn't necessarily need a terribly uh, well-developed policy at that time. We just, we just needed to try some things. And as that policy has developed and changed over the course of years, uh, we, have, we have recognized that we should be developing market structures that are more reflective of the costs and benefits of these types of technologies that are, that are deployed at the edge of the grid, on the distribution grid, which is in the way that the grid is designed today, is, is not typically where generation resources have been deployed traditionally. That said, the, the problem with this bill, and the reason why Clean Energy New Hampshire opposes it, is that it's, it's looking at just one aspect of this really complicated question of what are the costs and benefits of deploying generation resources in a system that wasn't necessarily designed for them to be deployed in those places. And there are benefits. Uh, there's, they're, they're numerous. We could look at the reduction in the, the amount that our, our distribution utilities have to pay into the regional capacity markets. We've talked already this morning about the amounts that the utilities pay for their demand, uh, their, their transmission charges. Um, and there are more. And if you were, if any of the representatives here were interested, we could walk through the value of d distributed energy resources study that's underway, which is very comprehensive and is in fact looking at all of these questions. Um, and so, so I would say simply that uh, there is a process underway that is, that is looking at these questions in a really fulsome manner. And, and there's no need for the legislature to weigh in at this time because that process is playing out at the Public Utilities Commission and it will look at questions like the one that this bill addresses. So with that, I'll take any questions. Yes, uh, Representative Kelly Pitts, recognize for a question. Do you believe that when the um, study is released, the Public Utilities Commission will take efforts to change the formula? It is my understanding that that is, that that is how, how things will go, and that it will likely happen through a, 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 an officially adjudicated docket that goes through the, the entire formal PUC process, um, and all the parties will be allowed to weigh in on the evidence that's presented. How well? Will that be, I know you can't speak for the PUC, but will that docket take as long as what this first study is taking? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, y you know, pr predicting what happens at the PUC, I think, is a bit like predicting what will happen at the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, and so I will decline to make a prediction in that regard. I would say that it was my personal hope uh, that it would it would be more expeditious than than what has you know, the, to 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 just take one step back. The the net metering docket is uh, one of the most complex and longest running dockets at the New Hampshire Public Utilities Commission. Most dockets do not take that long, so I would hope that it would be faster. Well, although it, I, someone who who is more in the PUC process than me could answer this. It may actually take place as part of that docket. In fact, I actually believe that, but, but I'm 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 speaking out of turn. I'm not actually 100 percent certain about that. Thank you. Representative Kelly Pitts, question? I'm sorry, Representative McGee, excuse me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so it sounds to me like, I will paraphrase what I think you're saying, which is that the solution that's being proposed by this bill is, um, is making assumptions that we don't yet have the answers to because there's pending work being done on some very complex calculations that would give us a better understanding of whether we should do it or not. Um, I, I would I would nuance the my answer slightly and say I think that the the cost of renewable portfolio compliance is is actually a fairly well established and and understandable number that that one could one could proceed with um, with this bill. What I would say though is that it's it's only one small part of of what goes into the net metering tariff, and considering it in isolation, increasing mm -hmm. it or reducing it. Um, 
is is really I think to not doing justice to to the complex task that is rate making, and that mm -hmm. we should let the PUC do what it does, which is make ra make rates. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yes, Representative Platt. Yes, given the answer you just gave, could this bill go ahead, be implemented, and then the PUC adjust what it otherwise might have done as a result of the uh, study that's going to be concluded in the spring? I, I believe that uh, that certainly, it, it's up to the discretion of this chamber as to what it's going to do. Uh, I, I'm not suggesting that it is uh, not within the authority of the House of Representatives to, to weigh in on this question. I'm simply suggesting that it, it doesn't strike me as a terribly sound way to make public policy to be, to be uh, picking and choosing the types of ways that the general court intervenes in, in utility rate making and, uh, and that there is a process ongoing and so it strikes me that this bill is unnecessary at this time. Seeing no other questions, thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Uh, the chair will call up um, Heidi Cole and Madeline Minot from Granite State Hydrogen Association. Thank you for coming this morning. Good to see you back here again. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, for the record, my name is Heidi Kroll. I work at Gallagher, Callahan, and Gartrell, and I represent uh, Granite State Hydropower Association. With me here today is Madeline Minot, um, now working with Essex Hydro, which is a member of Granite State Hydropower Association. So um, she and I are here to answer questions. Um, so we appreciate your time this morning. Um, I think our testimony is probably gonna sound similar to the testimony you've just heard from um, Clean Energy New Hampshire. We are um, uh, urging or requesting that this committee find this bill inexpedient to legislate. And um, again, recognizing the principle that's being discussed here, um, but asking that you please kind of pause and look at the context that we currently find ourselves in. So first, as you've heard, um, the PUC is nearing the end of a lengthy and in-depth process to study the value of distributed energy resources. And it began in the summer of, I believe it was 2017, f following uh, a docket, uh, an order in a docket DE 16-576. Um, and that docket actually was open pursuant to passage of a bill in 2016, which was House Bill 1116 at relative to net metering. And so all the parties in that docket, including the utilities, the consumer advocates, uh, renewable advocates, the Office of Energy and Planning at the time, all agreed to the adoption of alternative net metering tariffs um, to be in effect during the period of time during which data would be collected, um, pilot programs would be implemented, studies would be conducted. And so there was consensus around that. Um, and obviously for the past five or so years, the, um, PUC and now the Department of Energy staff and a diverse group of uh, stakeholders have really invested a significant amount of time and effort and money. Um, uh, consultants have been hired to undertake the research and the analysis um, needed to better understand the value of distributed energy resources. And so as you've heard that um, study will is expected to be completed in late spring. Um, and so we would simply ask you not to kind of do an end run around the study process, which was carefully designed um, and agreed to by a broad group of stakeholders. Um, the second piece of that was that um, as part of that, uh, the parties all agreed that at a minimum, the default service rate should be the, um, the credit for net metering until the study was completed. Um, and so again, we'd ask that you just honor that agreement that was reached among the parties um, across the board in that docket. Um, and the final point that we would like to make, and I think you've heard this this morning, is simply um, a recognizing that um, there is a lot of value, we believe, uh, around distributed energy resources and the um, excess energy that's put onto the grid um, in terms of avoided transmission costs, avoided capacity costs, obviously um, environmental benefits. And so uh, again, we're just concerned about looking at one side of the ledger and making a reduction without looking at all of the um, pluses and minuses that, we, that should be under consideration. Um, so, you know, we're looking, and I think everybody is looking for, to make sure that 
compensation is fair um, and obviously minimizing cost shifting as well, but I think we want to really want to make sure that we're looking at this in kind of fair and balanced way. So um, with that, we'd be happy to answer any questions. And again, we're respectfully requesting that you vote um, no at this time on this bill. I'll just add um, one oh. thing is that several of our members, as you heard from uh, the Department of Energy, our small hydros are the early adopters of the municipal host provision that was passed just last year. And we have additional members that are currently negotiating member agreements for group net metering with municipalities and counties and schools based on law that was just passed last year, which has a certain level of net metering credit in it. And so um, we would ask for consistency and, and not a changing the laws or the rules or the credit value every year so that we may in good faith negotiate with members and that if the credit value diminishes, that will diminish the value that is then given to the, those members. And the municipal host provision was passed with the intention of having a limited focused net metering expansion that was going to directly benefit municipalities, counties, and schools. And so um, I would ask that we sort of stay the course and as has been mentioned, let the value of DER study continue. Um, to answer a question that was asked previously, if this law passes, uh, the PUC could not then reinstate the credit because the PUC can't override laws. And so if the legislature passes laws, unless you explicitly give the PUC the authority to change it or override it, they would not be able to do that. And so I think that we should let that study see its course and uh, the docket process follow as it should. Thank you, uh, Ms. Pinot. Uh, Riverstank Hallie Beach, you have a question. Yes. I, I understand that about the laws that, that the PUC can't, but the uh, legislature can always override the PUC with a law. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Follow up. Follow up. In my world, which is kind of gone topsy-turvy because I'm not quite sure of who does what, where, and when. Is this still an adjudicative decision? And with the force, with the ability to, to force rulemaking, with the PUC, or is it a combined decision between the Department of Energy and the PUC? Um, I can explain to you my understanding is that the Department of Energy took over managing the consultants that are doing the study. And so they are seeing that process through. The study will be what it is. The results will be presented publicly. The Public Utilities Commission, which is the adjudicative body, would then um, decide if it should open a new docket based on the evidence from the study to then develop the third generation, what would be the third generation of net metering tariffs in New Hampshire. That would go through an adjudicative docket process. The Department of Energy is a party to those dockets now and would represent the state's interest. And so they could um, be a party to the docket, hire expert witnesses or have their own staff be expert witnesses and present evidence um, to support or if they don't like the results of the study in opposite of the study to say why they don't think it was accurate or to support it if that's the position of the state. Just like all the other parties will be presenting evidence, having witnesses and being part of the docket. Thank you. Rep Representative Pimentel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this legislation, well, th the docket that we're talking about, um, from what I understand, you, you're, all parties are going to be involved and they are going to look at a fair market value for um, how to, um, to charge um, generators, customer generators. This particular bill we're looking at um, is only applying to 
new customer generators, first of all. And I'm curious of your opinion of how that will affect the, um, the increase or, or how that will affect new generators as far as how, how will it uh, prevent them? Um, will it be a damper on new ge power generation? Um, first, I would say that uh, in our view, the way that new is used in, in this legislation is a bit ambiguous. It's unclear to us if it's um, new to registering as a customer generator or new to existing. Um, for example, a lot of the hydros have existed for quite a while, have been in service and generating since the 1980s. Um, however, they are newly uh, eligible as customer generators. And so um, to us, it's a little bit ambiguous what new in this context means, but certainly if the value of the net metering credit is lowered by any amount, in this case, by the compliance of the RPS cost, the, the payback to make investments in developing new distributed energy resources will be extended. Uh, and the value given back to members that participate in group net metering will be lowered. So it will certainly not encourage the development of more new distributed energy resources. Okay, seeing no other further thank questions. Uh, thank, you. thank you for your time, nice thank testimony. You. Thank you. And the chair at this time would like to call up our last speaker, the, uh, our distinguished orator, the Honorable Clifton Bailow. I, I don't. I don't know about that. <laughs> um, some people call me wordy. <laughs> good. Good morning, um, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I'm Assistant Mayor Clifton Bilo of the City of Lebanon here to testify on behalf of the city in support of this legislation. Um, we are a member of Clean Energy New Hampshire, but we on this bill uh, part ways with on this, um, and it might seem uh, that you know, it's against our own self-interest and that of other municipalities in general and renewable energy advocates and developers um, because it would reduce the default service energy, serv default energy service credit that large group net meter generation projects receive for their experts, exports to the grid by the amount of the RPS compliance costs that are embedded in those rates. Uh, the city supports this change in the compensation rate because it's the right thing to do and to eliminate one of the substantial and problematic cross subsidies uh, that occur um, under current net metering tariffs in place since 2017. Projects are currently being planned and implemented that count on the continuation of this inequity through 2040. So the sooner it's corrected, the better. The problem with the current uh, compensation is that it creates a missing money problem that results in substantial and I would say ironic undue cost shifting that did not occur before 2017 with traditional net metering. This particular change in how RPS compliance costs are calculated, creating the current missing money or cost shifting problem was not explicitly recognized by any of the parties, the PUC staff or the commissioners in DE 16576. Um, you know, in which that, a new iteration of net metering tariffs were developed. Um, at that time, I represented the city as both advocate and expert witness and was actively involved in negotiating two um, competing settlement agreements that actually became the basis for the PUC's order that's referenced in this bill. Um, I'd like to briefly explain you know, how this has changed because it, it helps to understand um, the nature of this problem. Um, each electricity supplier, including uh, the utility default service, has an RPS compliance obligation based on the amount of electricity delivered over the course of the year to their customers. Um, currently, RECs need to be procured and retired or alternative compliance payments made equal to about 25% of the power produced or supplied. In traditional net metering, which is sometimes called 1.0, when a customer generator exports to the grid, in, in effect turns the meter backwards so that power exported to the grid carries forward as a KWH credit to be used to offset future KWH consumption with PV often from summer to winter. Um, so a customer that gets about 
um, and you can use any number here, but say gets 1,000 megawatts hour uh, of power delivered to them over the course of the year, but over that same year might export 500 megawatt hours to the grid, um, ends up consuming and paying for a net of 500 megawatt hours. Their supplier's RPS compliance obligation under this kilowatt hour um, uh, crediting system is actually just based on the net 500 megawatt hours, um, which the customers already paid the full rate for, so it includes their share of RPS compliance, so there's no cost shifting problem here. Um, under the new tariffs, um, instead of carrying that negative KWH credit forward, if there's surplus you know, exports to the grid in any given monthly billing cycle, it gets monetized and paid the full default service rate credit. The problem is when the customer or, uh, or members of a group in group net metering turn around and receive that power, um, that is counted towards the RPS compliance obligation. So in the same example, the RPS compliance obligation is 1,000 megawatt hours instead of 500. And because you've given full uh, credit for 500 of those, there's, there's no revenue from that customer, or that customer generator, uh, to pay for the additional 500 megawatt hours of RPS compliance obligation. So that creates a cost shift that other customers have to pick up. And again, this, this was not com contemplated back in 2017, although there was a sense in all the settlement discussions that pro maybe full default service rate is maybe overcompensation more than what it should be, but that other things like n no credit for transmission were undercompensation. So it was felt, and the utilities actually agreed, all agreed to this at the time, that it was a rough justice, that it was fair, but without thinking about this particular problem. And, and so I just want to give a, a very specific example um, involving the city of Lebanon about how this actually could play out in this one to five megawatt range, which I might add, you know, the co commission's order and those settlements never contemplated that it would apply to the one to five megawatts. So you're talking about much larger scale of impact. So just as an example, the city last month entered into a, a interconnection agreement with Liberty in which we're going to pay over half a million dollars for distribution and actually some transmission system upgrades so we could interconnect five megawatts, I mean five 200 kW uh, microturbines. There will be one megawatt installation of landfill gas to energy. So that's going to produce about 8,000 megawatt hours a year. Uh, which we can, um, uh, uh, and that equals 8,000 renewable energy credits or RECs or certificates worth about $35 each in today's market, generating value to the city of over a quarter million dollars a year. Um, th this is roughly equivalent to about six to seven megawatts of solar PV or about, or maybe 300, uh, three megawatts or so of hydro. Um, in addition to the REC revenue, those 8,000 megawatt hours um, exported the grid in a group net metering arrangement at current rates of around 10 cents per kilowatt hour would generate another 800,000 in revenue to the city that can be used dollar for dollar to offset the same amount of power su uh, supply costs for group members. So the utility under that default energy service would still have an RPS compliance obligation for some 8,000 megawatt hours delivered to group members, but no revenue from that group or the host to pay for those compliance costs, shifting all of those costs to other ratepayers who aren't pr directly participating in net metering. And, and this number is actually readily knowable. Every time the PUC approves default service rates, um, part of that calculation, there's a line here, this is just the sheet from, the, from their um, uh, proceeding that specifies what that number is. So today for Liberty, that's about, um, 0.68 cents per kilowatt hour, and it's a little higher, about 0.77 cents per kilowatt hour um, uh, for Eversource. So that 8,000 megawatt hours works out to about 55 to $61,000 in RPS compliance costs, from which there's no revenue from, from uh, the, the, the people for whom that power is supplied to pay for those costs. So those are the costs that would be shifted in this kind of scale of, of one to five megawatt projects. Um, and, and I think the irony is, you know, in, in our case, the city uh, can benefit from selling those recs for its generation, earning a quarter million dollars a year while paying nothing for its own RPS compliance cost and that of its remaining group members. Um, and even though, in theory, selling those recs means you are assigning the renewable attribute um, of that generation to others, 
there's just an irresistible tendency for the city and other munici municipalities to say that we are offsetting some or all of our load with group net metered PV, or in our case, landfill gas, while paying nothing actually for RPS compliance. Um, and of course, I'm assuming that municipalities are not otherwise exempted from RPS compliance obligations, uh, which is an exemption the city doesn't support. Um, I did say that this would eliminate one of two substantial cross subsidies that I think are problematic. You've heard me talk about the other one, um, and that regards transmission cost. I won't go into detail on that, but, I'll, but just to com complete this example, Liberty and its customers pay for transmission uh, based on our share of the monthly hour of coincident peak demand measured by an actual meter at the interface between the transmission grid and the distribution grid. For some reason, Eversource doesn't have meters in that location, so I don't understand how they do it. But in any case, with Liberty, it's clear cut. And they've agreed that if we're exporting 850 kW of power to the distribution grid at the hour of coincident peak demand, it will lower transmission cost. If we did that on average over the course of the year, which we can do because we're, we'll run like a baseload plant. Um, that is worth some over 125,000 a year in reduced transmission cost, but we would not receive any credit for that. Um, but it does actually result in savings that other customers benefit from. So you could say between the two, there's a trade-off. Um, but that being said, I think it's still worth, you know, so I do propose an amendment um, in, in the text, it's in red on the last page, to just add um, a provision and that, and by no later than December 31st, 2024, which gives almost two years from now, uh, the commission shall determine through an adjudicated proceeding an equitable mechanism for giving credit for actual avoided transmission charges caused by such customer generators. Um, you know, I think look, if can, you had an amendment- Can you sum up, please? Yeah, if you had an amendment like that, I think it would gender more bipartisan, bicameral support, but even if you don't amend it, I think it's worth sending to the Senate because quite honestly, I've tried for the past three years to get senators up to speed on this problem with limited success. And so I think it would be worth um, uh, presenting that issue for the senators to understand because I don't think they really understand it with what they did um, last year in expanding net metering. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bill. Uh, I, the chair will indulge in asking a, a question first. I think you hit on part of the question I was going to ask you that if we were to pass this bill, w two things. Uh, it could be looked at still by the Senate, and the, and I, w we've heard testimony that said that the uh, PUC docket uh, should be coming out this spring, so there would be time for the Senate to decide whether or not, uh, whatever the, the PUC says. But also, would this also send a quasi message to the PUC uh, on the intent of the legislation uh, to help them in, in, in their docket? I, I, th I think it would. Um, w one of the subtle things here is that the reference to the order and statute, part of that order says that if you um, interconnect under these net metering 2.0 tariffs, you are grandfathered till 2040. Um, and we won't change those rates. So to the extent we revise rates going forward, it'd only be applicable to new projects. So, so that's sort of why this is a, a concern is because of that grant, grandfathering position. The, the commission would, by sort of its own word, uh, wouldn't go back, and I think everybody's expectations you know, from the legislature wouldn't go back and change these terms unless they had guidance from uh, the legislature that that would be appropriate to do. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they'll change them in the next iteration, but that could be a year or two out. Representative uh, McGee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, <coughs> from what you just said, then, would that address the concerns of the Hydro Association that just spoke about changes in contracts they've already entered into with customers based on the RPS being included? Uh, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure would what address that. Um, uh, I thought what you were saying is that the Public Utilities Commission would likely not retrofit. Oh, re re be retro, you know, re retroactive. Um, I, I, I think that would, it would help to clarify that legislation that maybe this only applies to, to, to projects that, um, it, it, um, are somehow new after the data passage of the bill, um, so, so that 
somebody who's gone under the current statue wouldn't be disturbed. Mm -hmm. I, you know, that, that might be reasonable. Or adding the promise of looking at an equitable transmission credit might also uh, uh, be a way to balance that. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, that and uh, oh, uh, just one follow-up. Follow and so <laughs> the references <coughs> earlier to the fact that new was a little ambiguous in terms of what it referred to in this bill, do you think that that's another piece that might need to be specified in order for it to achieve its objective? Um, right. When, when I was looking at this with our city manager and mayor and energy committee, um, I said, I, I can't really tell whether this would apply to our landfill gas project um, uh, because, well, we're right at that one megawatt threshold. Um, um, and um, we now have a, an, agree, an interconnection agreement. So from certain purposes at the PUC, we're already in the queue and um, current per tariffs would, would apply because mm -hmm. um, because that was sort of the basis of which they cut things off. Uh, on the other hand, we will be new. The thing isn't constructed yet. Um, so, so that isn't real clear. And, and also just sitting here reading this, the strikeout of applicable to large customers, that could be slightly problematic in that the provisions of that order only apply to up to one megawatt. There's nothing in that order that would apply to greater than one megawatt. The language in current law that's being stricken out says you're gonna apply what was applied to large customer generators, the 100 kW to one megawatt, will apply to these new one to five megawatt projects. Yeah. Um, so it, it did just occur to me that, 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 that there may be an issue there. I'm not sure. Thank you. Representative Flett. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. I have an observation as well. The question is, uh, I even though the current bill doesn't uh, have say anything about avoided transmission, the PUC is absolutely free to do that as a result of its docket? R right, I, I do think that that is definitely part of the value of DER that is being, that's part of the study that everyone agreed should be looked at, yes. Okay. My observation is to thank you very much for your written testimony and I encourage it in the future because I can only capture 10% of what you say. Right, and I think, I think everything was in my written testimony except for a little bit of ad-libbing, so hopefully. <laughs> yeah, uh, be, yes, uh, before we move on, I, it's uh, 11 o'clock and I think uh, I'm going to recess this public hearing temporarily so I can open up uh, HB 1629. Uh, HB 1629 is open for public hearing, and I'm recessing 1629 until the completion of the public hearing. I stand corrected. I, you know what the word assume means. So <laughs> <laughs> I thought we were running short on time. In fact, we had plenty of time. So my part, my apologies. Please go ahead, Representative uh, uh, Samson, with your question, we are still in public hearing for the current bill. Thank you, uh, <laughs> Representative uh, uh, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Below. Um, according to your own testimony, um, you mentioned that this RPS compliance cost uh, was assessed in 2017 um, uh, w with the understanding that, uh, as you mentioned before, uh, there were some th factors that were not considered and may be beneficial, and others that may be undervalued or overvalued, and this was considered to be kind of a compromise. Right. <clears throat> and in your own uh, financial example you used for your city of, of Lebanon, you mentioned that you could actually determine that you would be creating a transmission reduction cost for Liberty Utility. Yes. And in, in net, if I'm m not mistaken in hearing what you said, in net, you're actually giving a benefit to every other customer without any compensation. Right. So with all this stuff going on, wouldn't you think it would be better for us not to act on this bill right now because of the PUC docket that we're waiting for? Uh, and because you guys made a mistake back in 2017, right? <laughs> so now you're saying, before we have a new study, why not make another mistake? Is that correct? Um, and, and, and no, I'm not saying let's make another mistake. I I'm saying let's fix something that nobody intended. I, you know, it dawned on me about six months later <clears throat> that 
the, this changed, and I went around and talked to people, um, both PUC staff and other parties, and the utility, and, and, and it hadn't really registered with anybody that's, that the way that netting KWH reduced the calculation of the compliance obligation and monetizing DIN it, that just wasn't on anyone's radar screen. So, um, but, but because of the protracted, you know, w w the idea of the, the value of DER study came out of those settlements and was part of that order. And, and it's just taken a long time to, to get it this far. Um, and, and quite honestly, I'm not even sure this specific little piece was actually, is actually part of that study, although mm -hmm. it'll be subsumed within the question of def is full default service rate uh, credit appropriate or not. So I, I think it will be addressed. Follow up. Uh, yeah, and follow up question. Uh, the, in light of, of this, um, do you see any disadvantage for the legislature getting ahead of this and passing something now before that comes out versus waiting until it comes out and then passing a law maybe? Is yeah. there any pro or con for this? Oh, well, personally, I think yes, because um, there could be a lot <coughs> of projects that de get developed and locked in between now and when the commission actually makes a new decision. And, and that would be locking in this inequity um, which I'm just uncomfortable, a and the city. You know, I, I, I didn't make this decision to support this on my own. Um, it, you know, it's with the support of, of the city. Um, it, it, ju it just doesn't seem right. I mean, I mean, we have we have ambitions to put in a lot more um, larger PV, PV and storage. We quite honestly prefer to do it under the limited producers approach rather than net metering, because at, at this kind of scale, it's not, Personally, you know, as the person who sponsored the first bill that created net metering with Jeb Bradley way back in 1996, um, 97, um, I, um, I never imagined that net metering would be getting used for the scale projects. Um, it, 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 yeah, so that, that's just a whole okay. other story. Thank but, you very much. Um, <laughs> Representative Kelly Pitts, question, please. <laughs> Thank you, Cliff. I'm almost afraid to ask. Um, having been with you all <laughs> those years. <laughs> um, can you give me a concrete explanation or figures, and not all the convoluted ones, what would this actually mean to your town? So you have an electric bill now. Passage of this bill, which in your words is the right thing to do, what would it mean as far as an expense for your town? Um, w well, I I if, if it applied to our landfill gas to energy project, and, and I'm not sure it would, um, then it would reduce our compensation by on the order of 7%, um, w which our project would still be viable with that reduction. And I, and I say might, right now we're approved for one megawatt interconnection. We, we do anticipate um, some, some landfill expansion that could, we may want to add another 200 kW turbine, in which case we would be thrown into this larger group net metering situation. Um, and uh, in, in that event, it, it, you know, if this bill passed, it would apply to the entirety of the project. Um, uh, so, so we, 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 we would lose revenue from that element. Um, but on the other hand, we're getting a lot of money from selling the wrecks potentially from the project. So it just only seems right that we should pay for our, our RPS compliance obligation um, for, the, for the power that does end up getting delivered to us and our group members. Follow up. Cliff, without, without disclosing any major secrets, can you quantify that for me? Seven percent would be what? Are well, we that, talking that, about? That's that. It, well, it's right here. It's um, about sixty thousand dollars a year. And that's sixty thousand dollars. May I? Go ahead. That's sixty thousand dollars a year. From I don't know how many customers would be involved. Say that's around the average. Is that enough? to lower electric rates in general? Well, 
it just it adds up because it, that's this one project. You had a bunch of other projects and realized that this is for the next 18 years. Eventually, it's real money. Thank you. Think, uh, Representative Parshall, question, please. Thanks so much, Chair. Um, I understand uh, the in principle how this is a bill that you know provides some equity and uh, support for the uh, RPS, but um, I'm still concerned because this was a lot of this came about as you said, 1996, and we've grown quite a bit, and these loopholes have grown quite a bit since then. I can understand where this is, you know. You've benefited from uh, this, but uh, as far as having your transmission charges, uh, you know, avoided transmission charges, that's another big part, that's another big loophole right there. Yeah. And I question. can see that there's quite a few. I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to get a background, see if I understand this. And so the question is, is that, is this bill without your amendment to piecemeal and addressing the situation? And do you consider the amendment to be uh, necessary to balancing out the, uh, if nothing else, the finances on this bill? Um, well, if this committee passed this without the amendment, I, I would advocate for the amendment over in the Senate. And quite honestly, I, I think it's unlikely the Senate would pass this bill without an amendment or whether they'd pass it at all. But I think it's worth taking the time to educate the senators on the Energy Committee about this issue and problem so they, so they understand it better, quite honestly. Thank you for the follow-up. Representative uh, Pimentel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, unlike the chair, I, I only understood about 3% <laughs> of what you said. Fair enough. <laughs> um, my question is about, well, the f first question is, are you privy to what is going on now in uh, the docket that we're referring to? to um, yeah, so w w the city's still an active intervener and party in that docket, yes. And a follow-up, Mr. Follow Chairman? Follow-up. The, the follow-up is that, I mean, we're talking about a couple of things here, what's in this bill, and you brought up another part where it basically goes the other way, which, of course, I don't understand. Why not make the docket aware of this and have them roll all of this into whatever it is their final decision is going to be. I, I, I think this issue will be provoked when, when this gets, uh, my, my guess is that after this study is complete and D Department of Energy convenes stakeholders to review it, that somebody, probably the department, will petition the commission to, probably in the same docket, um, uh, to um, issue an order of notice to, to begin the process of uh, considering proposals for net metering 3.0, you know, what, what the tariffs will be going forward. Because that, that's always what was contemplated in the order that's referenced here, which, which was always recognized as an sort of interim step because there was just too many data gaps to be able to make uh, informed uh, decisions in, a, in an adjudicated context. One, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So getting back to something that's already been asked, knowing all of that, uh, you still feel that we should go forward with this bill with amendment as opposed to just waiting for what will happen out of this docket? <laughs> Yes, I, th I think that would be worthwhile because it kind of begins to straighten out two things that I think are sort of, you know, obvious problems. And, and, and the, the suggestion of giving the commission till December 31st of 2024 um, would, would allow them to, to proceed under that docket with that adjudication. That, that would be more time than was originally given to, to the commission to, to do what they did, which was a pretty which was a very robust um, uh, a proceeding at the time. Uh, uh, so I don't think it was rushed, but, but this actually gives even more time for the commission to sort that out and would allow them to apply it um, to these projects that, that uh, you know, already are kind of in the pipeline uh, before they set something 
for new projects going forward. Th what was contemplated in that order all along is that um, if you're in the interconnection queue before, you know, in that order it was, I forget what it was like, a certain date in September, even though the order was in June. If you were in the interconnection queue by that date, you could be grandfathered under the original net metering, and if you got in the interconnection queue um, after that date, you'd be subject to the new net metering tariffs. And, and the way it was also written, you can always go to the new tariff, but you can't go back to the old tariff once you leave the uh, original tariff. So I'm personally on net metering 1.0. I could switch to 2.0. It would actually be financially advantageous for me to do that, but, but I have, haven't bothered. Um, and, um, and so one, you know, one option, if, if nothing happens, and these two things are adjusted and other things are adjusted, it may be that projects actually want to move from 2.0 to 3.0 or not, you know, remains to be seen. Um, but the idea would be you can't go back. And, and once, you're, once you've gotten an approved thing, because it is important to the market and to the parties to have uh, some certainty as to what the deal is, because people are making major investment decisions based on those deal terms, I think it is reasonable to, to have this kind of grandfathering mechanism. And, and, but it's precisely because of that why, why I think it would be better to straighten in this out sooner than later and not let tens and twenties and thirties of megawatts of new, new generation get locked into something that really isn't right, doesn't feel right on the face of it. I'm beginning to Thank hear you. redundant answers to questions. Uh, <laughs> Representative McGee, if you have a completely new and different and improved question, <laughs> please. That's a very high bar, <laughs> <laughs> Representative Tom. Thank you. Um, actually, uh, for the benefit of the committee, I was hoping that you could go back to the original explanation that you gave us for um, my, uh, my understanding is that what you're saying is that we are currently uh, securing a credit that we shouldn't be securing uh, because of the way the original deal was structured that we're trying to eliminate, which I, I wish that was in the original <laughs> testimony to, to make us understand sort of what this is solving for. Um, and I think that it may not be clear here, so I, I was just wondering if you could, you could reiterate um, the point that you're making about that, it, not double dipping, but you know the, the fact that it's being credit, credited in multiple places and so it's not actually accurate. Well, um, yeah, so, so I think it is sort of double, possibly triple dipping, it, it, which, is, which is the thing that bothers me in good conscience. You, you've got the renewable advocates and the municipalities saying we want more of these renewables, but they're saying we're not gonna pay for any of the, R and we support the <laughs> RPS, but we don't, we're not going to pay for any of the RPS compliance costs, and we're going to shift that to other customers. Now, those do, I do think those other customers benefit in other ways, like lower transmission costs from what they'd otherwise be. We, we, you know, how much solar does that really depends, because some solar, if it's east-phasing, probably doesn't do anything. Yeah. Other solar, if it's more west-facing and hits those afternoon summer peaks, um, you know, can provide significant value. Um, but there's, you know, um, but because we don't, separately value that, there's no sort of price signal for new projects to recognize that they may or may not produce this value, because there's, we're saying all kilowatt hours are, are the same, yeah. and that's not really true. Yeah. Thank you, I think we've hit the limit uh, on this bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you, the Honorable Bailo. And I will ask uh, Representative Pimentel to give us the uh, blue sheet and the online results. There are four nine names on the uh, sheet opposing, oh, excuse me, yes, opposing HB 1599. And the uh, remote testimony, two people support, 116 oppose. Thank you, Representative. Uh, with that being said, uh, Representative Kelly Pitts, before I close the public hearing, do you have a question? Yes, I, I'd like to ask the question in the public hearing uh, of the chair. Having heard about the possible 
um, culmination of this study in the spring, can we ask the powers to be to provide the committee with an update perhaps in late April? An update, you say powers to be up, up, update from the, the PUC? PUC and the PUC and Department of Energy, since I will just cover all umbrellas, on the status of that study at that point. Not necessarily the details, but the status, because I don't want it to get away for 10 years. Uh, I don't see why not. We can certainly ask him to give us an update status. Certainly, absolutely. Thank Probably you. be desirable. Yeah. With that being said, public hearing is closed on uh, 1599. And I guess being a victim, I, I apologize for uh, being a victim of, of my own uh, efficiency, but uh, I guess we have an extended lunch break until 1 o'clock where we'll open up the next uh, um, bill.
Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Time to resume the SDNE meeting for February 8th. And we have three public hearings to go through this afternoon. The first one uh, will start here momentarily. Before we start, I would just like to remind everybody that if you want to speak on any of the bills that we'll be hearing this afternoon, you need to fill out a pink card and pass it along forward so that uh, I have it in front of me in order for you to be able to, <coughs> bless you, make a uh, contribution before the committee. So the first bill we'll, that we'll hear this afternoon is House Bill 1629-FN, which is relative to default service for net energy media metering and I will introduce the prime sponsor of the bill, Representative Berezny. Uh, thank you, Chairman Vos, members of the STNE committee. Thank you for the opportunity to introduce HB 1629 FM relative to default service for net metering. This bill aims to bring the net energy metering section of Chapter 362A Limited Electrical Energy Productions Act in line with the declared purpose of the chapter. Specifically, the Declaration of Purpose contains a finding that, quote, the goals of this chapter should be pursued in a competitive environment. We'll come back to that in a second. Net metering is when an electricity distributor is required to purchase excess electricity from their customer. The rate at which the distributor must buy this electricity is currently the same as the rate at which it sells electricity to other customers. This requirement to buy and sell electricity at the same price means that the distributor is not able to recoup overhead costs of facilitating the transfer. When you are forced to buy and sell something at the same price, it is not a competitive environment. Of course, there is no magic here. This missing overhead is recouped by raising electricity rates for everyone else. HB 1629 simply adds the missing definition for calculating the rate so that when an electricity distributor is buying from their customer, they are, they are able to subtract their overhead. By allowing the distributor to recoup their overhead, it levels the playing field and creates a more competitive environment. <coughs> Furthermore, this has the added benefit of keeping electricity rates lower. Fairness in a competitive market is important for electricity distributors, and keeping electricity rates low is important for electric customers and constituents. For these two reasons, I urge you to support this bill. And from listening uh, to earlier testimony and other bills, there were a couple of recurring um, things that came up uh, that I wanted to point out uh, as it relates to this bill. The first one is regarding the PUC docket on net metering. Um, I believe that this bill is, is more of a policy change uh, or, or a policy um, uh, uh, underlining. Uh, and so it, regardless of how that docket ends, I don't think um, it, it supersedes this bill. Um, and then uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that I've tried getting information on how the uh, default service rate is calculated uh, and it's been rather challenging um, getting getting these details so I think if this bill passes one of the end results will also be more transparency in how um, and how that that rate is calculated and I think that that will be beneficial for for this committee going forward um, and finally if I may I would like to read part two of the electric utility restructuring chapter on the purpose, um, and it says, a transition to competitive markets for, the el for electricity is consistent with a directive of part two, article 83 of the New Hampshire Constitution, which reads in part, free and fair competition in the trades and industries is an inherent and essential right of the people and should be protected against all monopolies and conspiracies which tend to hinder or destroy it. Competitive markets should provide electricity suppliers with incentives to operate efficiently and cleanly, open markets for new and improved technologies, provide electricity buyers and sellers with the appropriate price signals, and improve public confidence in the electric utility industry. Uh, thank you. With that, I will uh, conclude my testimony and take any questions. Thank you. So we have questions for uh, Representative Berezny. Thank you for introducing this bill. Representative Thomas is recognized for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Um, so in light of the unbelie unbelievably high spikes in electric bills recently, uh, will this bill uh, help 
to have people's electric bills lowered uh, at least by enough to where they notice it? Is this what this will, will, will help do? Uh, I can't guarantee that that will happen, but that is the intent. Okay. Uh, Representative Platt is recognized for a question. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Berezny, Representative Berezny, for taking my question. At first, I was puzzled about the language in this bill, but uh, got it straightened out in my own head. Um, you're excluding uh, uh, anything from default uh, service uh, other than the raw electricity cost. Uh, 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 you're, excluding, uh, you're excluding ancillary components of uh, ISO New England forward and forward capacity market payments, renewable portfolio standard costs, administrative costs, supplier profits, and the other non-electrical energy components as determined by the commission. Is that because the net, eater, net meter uh, is producing uh, electricity that has no capacity requirement at all and uh, has no, no uh, does not provide any ancillary service? And is that why you're excluding this cost because they're not providing that benefit? Uh, th that's correct. The, the overhead that the uh, electric uh, distributor has is not the same as the overhead that somebody producing, you know, with a few solar panels on their, on their house. So it doesn't make sense that they would have, um, that they would get paid for that overhead the same way. Okay, additional questions for uh, Representative Berezny, Representative McGee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking my question. Um, in looking at the language, I'm trying to figure out how you um, came to the conclusion that all of these ancillary items should be taken out of the default generation supply cost. I just don't understand how you arrived at this conclusion that this is going to help with competition. So these these um, this list is not um, the entire list. I, at the end here, it says and any other non-electrical energy components as determined by the commission. Um, the idea is that only um, the electrical energy portion of such supply should be excluded. Um, the other list are things that I was able to uh, gather from, from what, what things shouldn't be in the list because, th because they're not part of the uh, electrical energy portion. Um, Follow up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and do you have an understanding of why or how uh, these other components have become part of the charges that folks pay? I guess I'm trying to figure out how you figured out, as someone who's relatively new to this, why these charges should not be included like what you used to develop that calculation. It's not so much that these sh charges shouldn't be included, it's that the, f the fee should only be based on the default energy supply. Uh, and again, why? Uh, because th the net meter, because the, the person who's producing electricity does not have uh, all of the same uh, expenses as a uh, distributor. So you're trying to make the distributor have an, e a le an even playing field with the small producer? That's correct. Okay, additional questions for uh, Representative Berezny. Representative Bernardi. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Rep. Berezny. Uh, is, is, uh, is the rate that you're looking at uh, essentially avoided costs that was described in the original PURPA uh, language, that federal statute. Is that, is that how this is being calculated? Oh, I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, the, there's a federal law that focused on, in on these types of technologies and they used, they, they, they require that, that the utilities cover the avoided costs of the producers. So it's their, uh, um, they still have all their overhead no matter what. Uh, and so that's what you seem to be subtracting out. So this is going to traditional avoided costs. Is that what you're looking at? I think so, yes. Thank you.
You need a follow-up? All set. Uh, Representative Brezny, to follow up on the question that Representative McGee asked, are you saying in this legislation that since customer generators do not supply firm power, they wouldn't be entitled to forward capacity market payments? And since they don't have any administrative costs, they wouldn't be entitled to credits for administrative costs. Since they're not a supplier that earns profits, they wouldn't be entitled to supplier profits. Is what you're saying is that because these customer generators don't have these costs, they're not entitled to be reimbursed for those costs? No, that's exactly the goal of the bill, yes. Okay, thank you. Further questions for Representative uh, Berezny? Representative Callie Pitts? Thank you, Representative, for taking my question. Have you been contacted by anybody with a fiscal note? Because I am wondering, and I'm going to ask you, do you know or have any idea how much cutting out these costs would save electrical customers on the whole? So there is a uh, fiscal note that was submitted, but it was after this was printed, and I believe that the person speaking after me will have, um, I think he has copies of the fiscal note, and he may speak to that. Um. Follow up? Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, Representative McGee? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, my clarification is uh, in just reading the language that's here, it looks like it's not defining the small generator, it's defining that these costs are being taken away from the default generation supply. So that would be a very different kettle of fish <laughs> as to what we are saying here. Is, does anybody else read it that way? The way I read it is that for the purposes of this section, which is a section that defines how uh, customer generators will be compensated and credited, uh -huh. that since default service rate is mentioned several times in the statute as being the compensation mechanism for net metering customers, yep. that this definition of default service would apply for this section, meaning this part of the statute, okay. the net metering statute. Thank you. That makes sense. Okay, Representative Sompsich has a question. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Uh, Representative, for taking my call. Um, my, my question, um, <coughs> I think maybe the question was asked before, uh, what what percentage or what, if you take the current default rate and you take out all these things that you mentioned here, um, how much, what percentage of the costs would be cut? I mean, are we talking 1%, 2%, 50%? I mean, how dramatic a change it, would this be? Uh, it would be uh, almost half. Almost half. Uh, but I don't. I don't have. I have to do the math. To yeah, I understand. Out. I'm not looking um, for an exact number, but yeah. you're saying almost half. Um, so one thing that I had difficulty with is finding out this information because it's not defined anywhere, and and it's you know I understand proprietary to each each distributor. But um, could you yeah. speak a little bit louder, please? Okay. So it, it was difficult to get this info as I uh, I said in my testimony that. Uh, it's, it's, it was very difficult to find out in detailed information about the rate, um, and and perhaps part of this, you know, one of the end results of this bill is that uh, we will know that because that, that you know it would be re it would be necessary to provide that in order to to execute. Uh, but yeah. Okay. Well, just one follow up. Uh, follow up. Uh, I assume that you're aware that some of these costs that are mentioned here are involved in <coughs> trying to ensure a stable supply of energy and a reliable and non-volatile supply of energy to the system. So 
you know, it's not like these things are being thrown in there for no purpose. Um, they tend to help dispel some of the volatility in these rates uh, by ensuring, for example, the form of forward capacity market that there's something there when you need it. Uh, I mean, are you aware of the, of the implications of some of these uh, charges that why they're there? I think if, if those uh, expenses are incurred, they should definitely be reimbursed. But the, um, the, the, the issue is when they're reimbursed without incurring those costs. Okay, thank you. Okay, further questions for Representative uh, Berezny? Representative McGee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Representative Berezny, for taking my question. Um, we've had several discussions today about net metering and the state of net metering in terms of the docket at the PUC for the value of net metering. Um, and I think that what is the, the aim of this bill seems to be in, you know, further defining the rate setting and how it would be appropriate to go forward. But there is uh, an effort underway right now in the rate setting agency that's defined by the legislature to take care of this and to look at it deeply. So I'm wondering whether, uh, whether this may be, I, I hate to say premature since we've been using that so much lately, but, but whether this is sort of um, jumping the gun on what is currently underway, which has been a, a multi-year review uh, of how this should be valued. So. Th these default rates and how they're defined would be part of that review. And I, I just wonder if you could comment on that because this, this seems to be sort of, um, it's tangential to what the state has already undertaken for trying to define how this should be done. Uh, I, did, I did cover that in my testimony a little bit. Um, so m my, my perspective on this is that this, this is um, sort of enshrining policy that should already exist. And I don't think it will conflict with uh, any PUC decision. Um, so. Did you need to follow up? Well, I have, I mean, my thinking is that if the PUC is in the midst of trying to figure out how to assess this, then it would definitely have an effect on them if we changed the law, telling them what they could and could not consider, so. Um, yeah, I Sorry, uh, the language in the bill says, and any other electrical energy components as determined by the commission. So they, uh, it is still up to the commission to determine the final rate. Okay, so additional questions for Representative Berezny? Uh, Representative Callie Pitts? I'm trying to figure out how to word this. Would Default service rates, or do you know if default service rates for the regular customer who's not a net meterer, meter, metering person, that these things are included in the calculation of the default service? My understanding is that they, they are. May I follow up? Follow up. It, so if I am net metering, and 50% of my output is sold back, and the other 50% is not, will some of these charges that are currently in default service be applicable to me on the portion of the electricity that I do not send back to the grid? Are you talking about the overhead charges? I'm not All sure of I the understand. charges that are included, the ones you want to exclude. Oh, uh, may I? Yes, you're, the you're ones still you answering the question. The ones, you, the ones you wish to exclude, would they be included in the default rate of the service that I'm not selling to the grid or that I'm not giving back or that I'm not not metering because I'm going to be a consumer of a portion of the electricity? I, I would assume that it, it would be the same for what you sell back versus what you, are you saying that, well, if you're not selling it, then I guess I'm not really sure I understand. Um, are, I are you saying, do you get something if you don't? Well, if, if I net. We're not gonna have a discussion. No, let's not have it. Okay, so I think um, what Representative Callie Pitts is asking you is, 
should you pay the full default service rate for power that you buy from the utility? And of course, the answer to that is yes. That, that, that's what your rate would be. So she's asking you if the portion that they that the customer generator sells to the utility should that also be credited at the default service rate? I thought it was the part that, okay. Um, th so um, it should not be credited as the default service rate because that's, I mean, that's the point of the bill. I, I thought that she was asking about the part that you keep, not the part that you sell to the. Um, Okay, she's nodding her head. That's just what she was asking. But yes. I don't understand how, how that part would work. If you're not selling it, then there's no... Um, how then do it's you just electricity monetize? you buy, correct? Well, so you pay the price for it, right? Okay, additional questions for Representative Brezhne. Seeing none, we'll thank you for introducing this bill, and we'll move on to the next uh, presenter who will be Griffin Roberge from the New Hampshire Department of Energy. Thank you, Chairman Vose, uh, members of the committee for the record, Griffin Roberge from the New Hampshire Department of Energy. Uh, department takes a neutral position on this bill, but obviously wanted to provide observations as we always do. Um, what was it? Uh, I did pass around a copy of the fiscal note that was generated by the department. You'll note that it was revised as of February 2nd, so I understand some members of the committee might not have had a chance to review it, as Representative Kelly Pitts mentioned. Um, so um, I just wanted to give everybody a chance to have a copy of that for their review. Um, I, I did have some discussions with the prime sponsor of this bill last week, and I very much appreciated the opportunity to talk with him, get a sense as to um, what his aim was what, for the bill and everything like that. Um, he did ask me some questions, and I will follow up with him offline to get him answers to those questions. And uh, obviously, if the committee has any questions, feel free to ask. And uh, I, I might not have the answer, but I can certainly follow up. Um, regarding the language in this bill, um, obviously, it defines default generation supply service um, as the electrical energy portion of generation supply and excludes uh, other certain components, such as ISO forward capacity market payments, RPS compliance costs, administrative costs, et cetera, et cetera. Um, after talking uh, with other staff members at DOE, as well as you'll see uh, outlined in the fiscal note, the fiscal note has a little bit more clarification as to the, obviously, fiscal impact of this bill. But um, so one of the main concerns I think the department wanted to raise is that it could be near impossible to exclude some of the costs that are noted in this bill from net metering tariffs. Um, default service providers obviously go out to bid for the power that they provide, but the costs for that are not broken out by forward capacity payments, administrative costs, supplier profits. Um, requiring bidders to disclose the various aspects of these costs would at best potentially slow down um, default service biddings and auctions, um, and at worst, again, at worst, could potentially lead to failed default service auctions. Um, again, as the um, committee is certainly well aware by this point, um, the department is hiring, a cons has hired a consultant and is working on a value of distributed energy uh, resources study that is expected to be out in late spring of this year. Um, again, that study will give a very uh, solid overview as to where um, the value of these resources going forward, what's been done to date, potential cost impacts, and that type of thing. Um, so uh, this bill, along with a, a couple of other net metering-related bills, might be premature at this time, pending the outcome of that study. Um, 
and with that, I'm certainly willing to answer any questions, but um, can certainly follow up uh, with people offline if uh, I don't have the answer for you today. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Roberge, for your testimony on this bill. Is it not true that the commission requests proprietary information from utilities and other sources on a routine basis and keeps that information confidential? That's correct. And uh, to further follow up on that, I think that's what I was, I didn't say it explicitly, but um, that's one of the concerns, I guess, when it comes into the bidding process is some of this information, again, is proprietary and requiring that to maybe be disclosed to break down uh, costs for net metering tariffs might be problematic during that bidding process. Would it be your judgment that this bill requires that information to be disclosed in order for the commission to come up with uh, a tariff for default service? I think, I think it would, yes. Okay, additional questions, Representative Platt. You're saying this could not be kept in camera, that's a, a legal term, which you, uh, uh, that it would have to be, it, it cannot be kept in camera, it would have to be disclosed, why? I, I, have, I apologize, did you say in camera? Yeah. I'm sorry? I'm, so, I'm, I'm, so, I'm not familiar with the term, I apologize. It's a legal term, but I'm not a lawyer. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 but I, I, I've rubbed no shoulders with attorneys all around me for my career. No, that's what I'm just doing. Um, I, I, mean, I am certainly not an attorney by any stretch of the imagination, for sure. Um, I can certainly offer you a more extensive answer, but I know when it comes to auctions and bidding process and that type of thing, some costs, including some of those outlined in the bill, are proprietary and tend to be obviously confidential, requiring some level of disclosure of those costs for the purpose of defining the, these costs for the, for the net metering tariff might be a bit problematic. Couldn't the utility supply a net cost that was essentially avoided cost, avoiding all these, excluding all these other things, and not disclose the breakdown except to the PUC and in camera? I mean, it could, but what that, what that does to the length of the bidding process for default service auctions, I couldn't predict, but it, at best, again, it might slow it down a little bit. And how that impacts utilities and that type of thing, I'm, I'm sure they could speak to that in greater detail. Okay, additional questions for Mr. Roberge. Representative Sompsich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Roberge, for taking my question. Um, <clears throat> I noticed in the fiscal note, uh, you do mention that um, uh, this bill could, has the potential for reducing the costs uh, uh, per kilowatt hour. Forgive me, um, I'm sorry, what paragraph are you looking at? Oh, I apologize. So I'm looking at the fiscal note you s gave us. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, in that fiscal note, um, you mentioned that the um, uh, bill appears to reduce the per kilowatt hour credit provided if a county or a local government participates, blah, blah, blah. It has yeah. the potential for reducing those costs. But at the same time, on the second part, second page of the fiscal note, it says there is the potential that net metering distributed generation may reduce transmission costs and avoid other utility costs, which would reduce or otherwise mitigate the impact of the cost increases. So I assume what you're saying here is there is some ambiguity whether not reducing the one cost uh, may, may actually uh, result in some other costs being higher and therefore uh, mitigating the impact of, an of a decrease. Is that wh what your intention was to, to say here or, or what? Can you explain that further? Sure, and if, if you'll allow me, it's going to be a little awkward. Just give me just a second just to sure. read the paragraph well, again one more time here. Sure, so uh, forgive me. So that second paragraph on the first page of the fiscal note, Obviously, the bill is um, defining the default service rate for the purposes of these tariffs to include the electrical energy portion of that supply, but exclude these other costs. Mm -hmm. So, in essence, it's lowering the cost of the of the tariff that's given to those who net meter and export to the grid. Um, so, in essence, you would, in that paragraph, have a decrease in electrical cost. But the department did also note that. Um, a reduction in the credit provided for these exports, you know, would tend to reduce electric rates, in, you know, in terms of, and also decreasing electrical costs for consumers. But as you mentioned, you know, distributed energy 
uh, generation does have the potential to reduce transmission costs and avoid other utility costs. So to the extent that this credit may disincentivize or incentivize further renewable energy projects in the states and customer generators, you know, that's something that the department noted. To, we can't give any specific numbers or anything like that. It's hard to, it's hard to figure. But circling back to what I had said initially is that, again, the department is working with a consultant to study these issues, so to look at this more holistically in a study rather than a kind of a piecemeal approach, if you will. Thank you very much. Thank you. Further questions for Mr. Roberge, Representative Oxenham. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Roberge. We heard this morning from Mr. Cliff Bilo that there's uh, you know, net metering was rough justice, that you know the, your, the entire system benefits from avoided transmission costs, but for the 2.0 customers, which are a subset, there is this missing money issue. And that to a certain extent, they cancel each other out. Mm -hmm. you, you've raised some other issues. I, I think this really goes, and I know this has to be a question, but for, for, for clarity's purposes, you, you, is it not the case that this is why we have professional regulators who understand the complexities of tariff and why the DOE hired a consultant so that all of these, there are many interacting components. Some go take it up, some take it down. To, to try to pick out one element or as, as this one does to cut in half the default service rate. Um, I, think, I, think it, I think what you suggested was that it was premature. Did I, I think I heard. I, I believe I said that, correct. Yeah, so. Um, is that your question? That I was the clarification I was looking for, so thank you very much. I, 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 have a, I have a further question, but I think it's better for the utilities. We, we so often hear that these changes that we suggest make difficulties for the utilities in their uh, ability to assign rates, that things are done by hand, they're not even automated systems, that we, we could be increasing the costs in ways that are entirely outside of this purview, but they are costs to our utilities, which would then be passed on to uh, customers, ratepayers. Okay, thank, thank you. you, thank you. Uh, in response to the question, I thought it was gonna be a lot more difficult and you're gonna ask me to respond to substantial things that Cliff Bilo mentioned and there's no way <laughs> I, can, I can match that. Um, I, I wouldn't do that to you. In, in any <laughs> case, uh, yeah, you know, uh, circling back to how I answered Representative Sonsich again, you know, this study will, will be comprehensive, look at all of these factors and provide policymakers as well as stakeholders who are involved in the DACA process as well as state agencies. Um, you know, guidance on, you know, the value of distributed energy resources in the state. It's kind of focused solely on, you know, New Hampshire, not what Massachusetts is doing, Maine is doing, and all those other things. Um, you know, obviously we, the department, you know, takes direction from policymakers such as yourselves, but, you know, it, you know, it, states want to obviously be sure that policymakers are fully informed of, you know, the, the proposals that they bring forward and why I'm here today. Thank you. So Representative Kelly Pitts has a question. All of us on this committee, and I, I, I'm going to speak, I'm going to take the liberty and ex talk for all of us, are concerned about electricity rates. However, just confirm for me that all these inclusive things in this rate, in this default service, was approved by the PUC after an extensive docket and formula compilations. Would you confirm that? This I mean, is I not willy-nilly. Sure, but I mean, that's different for every utility and a different rate case and, every, and everything like that, yes. Thank Before you. the PUC. Okay, uh, one other question for you. Your fiscal note says that state, counties, and local governments are likely to experience decreased expenditures for electricity due to this bill. And it also says that it would in turn decrease electricity costs for consumers. So the department is re reasonably sure that this bill would indeed lower costs for consumers and municipal and county governments. Yes, we recognize the potential for that because, again, we're separating out for the purposes of net metering tariffs for the default service rate. We are 
at least as this bill defines it, we are defining that rate as including the electrical energy portion of that supply, but excluding these other costs. So by excluding those other costs, you are in essence decreasing the, def the default service rate that's included in the tariff, which in essence reduces the tariff or the credit that's given to customer generators, which in turn would <coughs> reduce energy costs. A lot of steps there, but yes. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. All right, so you know, oh, there's one more, Representative McGee. A further clarification. Did you not also mention that there was a potential for a failed default service rate options? That I, I did mention that at the outset, correct. So, so we would be looking to lower electric bills at the rate of destabilizing the system? I think, I think again, circling back to what Representative Plett had mentioned, and, and I'd certainly like to follow up with the committee and get more clarity on the confidentiality of some of these costs, but um, requiring a breakdown of all these costs in default service bids, again, at best would prolong the bidding process, at worst could potentially lead to failed auctions. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no further questions, Mr. Roberge, we thank you for thank testifying. You. And I would like to call on our next testifier, who is Joseph Kwasnick of Concord, representing himself. Mr. Kwasnick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the committee for allowing me to uh, testify today. Um, as I testified this morning in the previous bill, I'm a founding member of the New Hampshire Network and uh, former chairman of the New Hampshire Electric Cooperative and a retired environmental executive at National Grid. I am today submitting written comp testimony in opposition to House Bill 1629. My reasons for opposing the bill are as follows. One is the bill seems to exclude, with the exception of the electrical energy portion of default generation supply service, all of the ancillary components of supply, such as ISO forward capacity market payments, renewable portfolio standard costs, administrative costs, supplier costs, and other non-electrical uh, components as determined by the Commission. Uh, and I think we, as we spoke about this morning, in June of 2017, the PUC established uh, net metering tar tariffs that are currently in effect. These tariffs were considered appropriate in that they avoided any unjust or unreasonable cost shifting between customer classes. The current net metering tariff properly credits the exportation of electricity from small systems up to 100 kW and includes the value of default service, transmission, and 25 percent of distribution. For large systems between 100 kW and 1 megawatt, compensation for export is at the value uh, of default service only. Because the PUC is currently studying the value of distributed energy resources under the VDER program, um, I want to make sure I don't misspell mis misspell that of uh, the VDER program and will be expected to make future adjustments to the net metering credits as necessary to avoid cost shifting. This study is expected in the spring, thus making any legislative ch changes premature. Uh, it also seems to be, uh, excuse my language, a quote unquote a backdoor to minimize compensation to net metered customer generators in New Hampshire. The bill essentially mandates compensation to net metered customer generators at essentially wholesale rates. This is inappropriate and fails to recognize the system benefits and value of net metering. And I just make a note that prior bills in, before this, this committee and in prior sessions of the legislature have tried to actually um, bring down the compensation to net metering to wholesale rates, and those have failed in the past. And this is essentially uh, a bill that is trying to do that. Uh, the bill inappropriately interferes with the current default generation supply definition, including its ancillary components, and prejudges the outcome of the PUC VDER study. It should not pass and should be determined to be inexpedient to legislature, legislate. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I would take questions. Okay, questions for Mr. Kwasnick. Uh, Representative McGee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Kwasnick, for taking my question. Um, I can remember in past sessions that we've had people come to speak to us about uh, the value of distributed energy <coughs> in other places in the region. And I'm just curious, we're not the only state that's undertaken trying to look at what the value of these resources are. And I was wondering if you had any information um, 
of how that's come out in other places? Because I know we've seen evidence in the past. Um, I'm not aware, I'm sure there have been studies in other states within yeah. the New England area because I think they're a little bit ahead of us in terms of um, the actual Im implementation of these regulations and these, uh, these laws. I do know that in the state of New Hampshire, um, with my experience with the electric co-op, is that um, back about five years ago, the question of uh, the value of, of renewable energy and net metering came up before the, uh, the board of the New Hampshire Electric Co-op. And the staff at co-op was uh, asked to actually consider what the benefits and costs uh, to the system were for net metering. And uh, the co-op actually came up with a number that was slightly different than the default, but very close to it. And their belief, the staff belief, was that the default rates that are applicable to the other IO, IO investor-owned utilities in New Hampshire are, are pretty close to what, um, what the value of uh, renewable energy and net metering is in the state. So I think the, um, their research, and I don't have it in front of me, it was something that was done five or six years ago, was that the, the rates that were uh, that net metering uh, sources get today are pretty fair mm -hmm. for both the customers and for the generator. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Sopsich has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Kwasnick, for being here. Um, if, if we were to, uh, the, with this bill, reduce the the price down to the wholesale price, as you mentioned. Um, are all wholesale energy units equal? Is there no quality difference between whether I generate uh, one unit of energy with coal versus one unit of energy with solar? Uh, I, I'm not an expert in the market, but a wholesale price is whatever the market will is offering uh, uh, a megawatt hour at. And it can vary from day to day, from minute to minute, and from month to month. So, uh, and there may be some value in some priority payments for various generation that is of higher quality, such as renewables and things of that sort. Well, excuse me, you know, follow up? Follow up? Well, I, I was just wanting to ask you whether, what are those qualitative differences? Do you know, uh, could you comment on what qualitative differences there might be between? one energy source <coughs> versus another. Sure. Um, I do know that in the uh, report, rep uh, the RPS market, not just in New Hampshire but in other New England states, is that uh, there is various uh, payments, pr premium payments paid for what we'll call higher quality renewables that in many cases have diverted renewables, renewable wrecks from our state to other states like Connecticut, such as some of the, um, uh, I think some of the, um, the solar wrecks have actually been siphoned off from our state to those other states. But yeah, there's some quality difference in terms of re generation. Um, but again, it's it's in the market. The market makes a de makes a determination of what those rates will be on a day-to-day -day and hour-to-hour -hour basis. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned in your testimony that this bill would tamper with the definition of the f default service rate. That's correct. Where in statute is the default service rate defined? I'm talking about the, where it's defined in the RSA. RSA. In RSA 362-A semicolon 9, there's a definition of default service there. And that's what I was referring to. Can, can you point me to that language? Um, I'd have to go back to my chair, but I think it's right in the opening paragraph of that RSA. Okay, thank you. Representative Callie Pitts? There's a couple of uh, words that over the years to me have been red flag words. May, could, and that are not positive. And in the statement from Mr. Roberge, we had one of the red flags that when we do this, it could reduce the amount of future development of facilities, in other words, customer generators. Do you believe that to be true? Uh, I, I guess I, I do believe that to be true. If indeed uh, when you remove all these ancillary components from the default uh, generation supply service, uh, and you're getting down close to what I'll call wholesale rates, uh, many of these uh, 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 net metered customer generators will uh, choose not to install these facilities. And also the question is, will they tend to keep, will they renew them when their uh, useful life is up? I, I think you'll see a lot of net metering, metering, say, solar folks as they get to the end of the life of their components, if they're being paid at this lower rate, they will not tend to uh, uh, replace those, those systems. 
So it's the problem of replacement, but also initial installation, too, will be much chilled in the state, in my view. May I follow up? Follow up. Follow up would be, do you believe that these future developments could have more value in them than the small, and I believe it would to be a small amount of money, and I, I'm not talking about pennies, but I'm not talking about hundreds of millions either. Uh, do you believe that these future developments could be worth more than what we may return now? With uh, the passage you, you're of this speaking bill. of uh, net metered uh, mm -hmm. generator resources. I believe that, uh, that this resources such as solar, wind, and other renewable sources will become more valuable in the future, especially as we um, find that we are going to be carbon constrained in the next 10 to 20 years, which I think will. Uh, will occur within our economy. So those uh, resources will become much more valuable. The, the resources that are more fossil-based, um, coal, which is almost gone, and also even natural gas, even though it's a lower carbon emitting sources, it's not a zero carbon emitting source. So I think they'll become less valuable in the future when we get into carbon constraint economy. Thank Representative you. Platt is recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for taking my question, Mr. Kwasnick. Twenty years ago, the wholesale market was created. Uh, we had re-regulation, re uh, generation split off from uh, the utilities, and uh, it was a competitive market. And ever since then, I've seen s states undermining that market with subsidies for this and that. And, and uh, aren't these subsidies, uh, a generator in the open market for raw electricity gets paid uh, uh, locational marginal prices, essentially the raw energy price, period. Now they get paid for other things, uh, or they provide other services. By, by providing more than that to uh, customer generators, aren't we slowly undermining that market? Uh, I think we should be very careful when we start to talk about subsidies to these particular sources, because if you go back into the supply chain, whether it's a, a gas or oil or even coal, there are subsidized subsidizations in those produ producing processes. So. I'm not prepared today to really say what's the right balance, but um, it's, it's, you would have to tease out all the subsidies that are in the supply chain for all these various resources. Okay. We uh, thank you. Uh, you've had your two questions. And we have to move on because we have several more people and we're running out of time. So uh, thank you, Mr. Kwasnick, for your testimony. And I would now call on Ian Oxenham, uh, who is representing himself from Plainfield, New Hampshire. And I'll alert Representative Oxenham that it might be a conflict of interest for you to ask questions of this <laughs> testifier. Of my legislative assistant? <laughs> Thank you. Please turn on the mic. Okay. Hello. I'm Ian Oxum. I'm a licensed New Hampshire attorney. I also have a degree in energy regulation and law, and this is an area I practice, and I wanted to submit some testimony to uh, correct what I feel are some faulty factual premises this bill is based on. As the I uh, go into more detail in my written testimony, but in the interest of time, I'll probably just try to be a bit more brief than what I have here. My first thing I really want to make uh, clear is that when a net meter generator exports energy to the local distribution system, they are avoiding far more than just the raw electricity costs. The idea that they are all not ca avoided capacity costs, or avoided ancillary costs is simply false. And there's several reasons for this. One. Uh, when a utility arranges to provide default service to its customers, it goes to a supplier, and it, that supplier bundles that all into a single per unit price. And so when, and that's usually somewhere around the range of eight cents per kilowatt hour. When a customer generator exports energy to the local distribution grid, that reduces on a per unit basis the amount of energy that supplier has to deliver and thus for the utility avoids basically eight cents on the default service component. I'm not gonna go into distribution and transmission just in just for simplicity, because I think that's also beyond the scope of this bill. 
And two, these are actually avoid costs for that supplier as well, because ISO any bills the supplier for ancillary costs based on how much energy gets delivered to that wholesale meter point. And ca capacity costs are based on coincident peak demand. And I want to be very clear that even though solar is not a firm resource, Iosolini has been very carefully has very carefully calculated the fact that it has reduced peak uh, demand, peak summer demand in New England by over 800 megawatt megawatts, and it has uh, reduced capacity costs in the market simply from that by at least tens of millions of dollars. And when you factor in how it has suppressed the clearing price in the full capacity market, solar has probably reduced capacity costs in the wholesale market region wide by hundreds of millions of dollars per year. So the idea that solar exports to grid are only avoiding raw electricity costs is demonstrably false from a factual position, from a factual standpoint. And I really want to be clear that most of these costs that there are including default service that we that I think the bill sponsor assumed uh, were not being avoided by solar exports actually are being avoided by solar exports to the distribution grid. And I want to make that very clear today that as a result of this, if this bill to go forward, what you would have is a situation in which the customer generator is being compensated at a far less rate than the cost they are actually avoiding for the utility. And you basically have a situation where the customer generators will be charged for default, be charged more for their default service than the cost of actually providing them with default service on a net basis. And so I would argue that as a punitive uh, rates that are two customer generators that do not reflect cost causation, and that is why this bill should be in the legislature. But again, these things are being valued in the proceeding we it was mentioned on in the VDR, VDER value stack. And the studies we're looking at, they are explicitly looking at the avoided capacity and avoided ancillary service costs. And we should really let that process play out to determine what they are. But And as the previous speaker mentioned, the uh, co-op also found that basically the avoided costs are pretty close to default service costs on the energy side. And that's why they were happy to pay that. And this similar thing has happened with community power aggregations. That the draft language in the template for the community power templates, how they're gonna handle net metering, is they're gonna pay the full energy service rate. They don't, that, that does not include transmission distribution because that's still handled by the utilities. But the draft language is free of any legal requirement. They are going to pay the full energy service rate for exports that they, they charge to the customer generator because that is a fairly accurate reflection of the cost they will actually avoid for the community power aggregations. And that is free of any legal compulsion. And because they do not, because they do not view it as a subsidy, they view that as a roughly accurate value for what the customer generator is exporting. And so I believe this bill has been based on a faulty factual premise. And for that reason, it should be rolled inexpedient to legislate. And I go into more detail in my written testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Are you willing to take questions? Yes. Yes, I am. Okay. Representative Platt has a question. Thank you. Yes, I'm aware of ISO New England's practice of adjusting demand for the impact of this stuff. But what obligation does any net meter have to provide at peak time as, as opposed to a generator which gets paid for that service? They do, not, they do not have an obligation, but they nonetheless provide the service. They, and because, as, they, as ISO has calculated, Solar has reduced, as of 2020, it was about 800 megawatt reduction. And if you simply multiply that by the uh, Korean price in terms of how much capacity costs are avoided, you get about $50 million. And I think it's even more once you factor in how that has suppressed wholesale clearing prices. So they, though they have no obligation to do it, they are providing the value of avoiding uh, capacity costs. The thing is that from ISO and E's point of view, they, are, they aren't acting as a supplier, they're acting as a load reducer. They're simply reducing the amount of load the centralized system has to serve, which means less centralized system, less, which means less central generation capacity has to be procured in order to meet peak summer demand, which creates cost savings for the entire system and has reduced capacity costs that every repair New Grant has paid by tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars every single year. Representative Sompsich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Oxenham, for being here. Um, so if I understand your, your, your uh, appeal here, correct me if I'm wrong, you're basically saying that uh, <clears throat> a net meter uh, uh, generator, uh, when it provides energy into the grid, is, is a load reducer, and therefore 
being a load reducer, the amount of load it's reducing, that is the avoided cost of the utility that now doesn't have to provide that energy. And therefore, they should be equally compensated at the same rate. Otherwise, the utility would be making money off of someone who's generating their own energy. Is that correct? Essentially correct. There is true that on the distribution side, it gets a bit more complicated because the it's still going on the distribution grid, so you can argue the utility is still incurring some costs on the distribution system, but it is definitely avoiding energy and transmission costs. Thank including you. Including the energy costs, I mean inclusive of capacity and ancillary service and also supplier profit because, like I said before, when you export to the distribution grid, that kilowatt hour goes to someplace else on that same distribution grid, which means you reduce the amount of uh, the number of kilowatt hours that have to be imported from the bulk transmission system, which means the supplier delivers less energy, which means the supplier charges less. And that is how you have a situation where pretty much the, the full default service cost, may be exclusive of any RPS compliance costs, is avoided by that export to the grid. And also due to other reasons of how RPS compliance costs work, usually most exports from net media generators also avoid RPS compliance costs for other reasons, but I don't have time to get into that today. Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Representative McGee has a question. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Oxenham, for taking my question. Um, it, it sounds to me, my, my summary of what you're saying is that you're saying this bill doesn't achieve what it seeks to achieve, because I did ask the sponsor what he was trying to achieve with this, which yeah. was really right-sizing the, these costs and uh, thinking that he was doing something to help save people money. Yeah. And it, it sounds from your testimony, and I, I really appreciate you giving us some measurable pieces here uh, that we were able to jot down so that we have a better understanding. But it, it sounds to me like what you're saying is that the bill wouldn't achieve those ends because it wouldn't, it would, uh, it would be quantifying something that isn't accurate in terms of how the system's actually operating. I think that that's mostly what I'm trying to say. M more specifically, though, what I think is the bill is trying to achieve a, the appropriate level of compensation for net metering, but due to a faulty factual premise, it, the sponsor is assuming that value is far less than it actually is. Because, And I really don't blame uh, people for this because mm -hmm. this is something, even as a trained lawyer, someone with a specific degree in this, it takes me a while to figure out exactly how the money flows, who avoids this. And so I am not at all surprised that this factual mistake was made, mm -hmm. but I just w wanted to correct it because I think the goal should be to compensate uh, solar for the cost it avoids. Mm -hmm. And uh, but and if you're only compensating it for avoided low energy costs, you are far f uh, compensated far, far less than the cost that is actually avoided when you're putting an extra kilowatt hour onto a distribution grid as opposed to the bulk transmission grid. And so I believe the sponsor was well-intentioned in trying to evaluate appropriately, but he was operating on a faulty factual premise. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, We'd like to move on. We have two more people who would like to testify. We appreciate you being here, Mr. Thank Oxenham. Thank you for hearing me. And I would like to call now on Kelly Buchanan of Clean Energy, New Hampshire. Ms. Buchanan. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have written testimony for everyone. All right, for the record, my name is Kelly Buchanan. I'm Director of Legislative and Regulatory Affairs at Clean Energy New Hampshire. And I'm here today uh, before you in strong opposition of House Bill 1629 um, for a couple of reasons that have already been discussed, so I will be brief. Um, but as a, as a brief history lesson, um, the General Court in 2016 passed House Bill 1116, which uh, tasked the Public Utilities Commission with developing an alternative net metering tariff. And so within that docket, um, they took a look at the tariff and issued an order in 2017 to set the net metering tariffs um, as they currently are. And so in improving these tariffs, the PUC found that they were appropriate. Um, and then on top of that, the PUC is continuing to study uh, the value of distributed energy resources and will make the appropriate changes to the alternative net metering tariff if they find that's necessary. And 
I want to highlight for the committee today the importance of the stakeholder process that's been going on in that docket. Um, it's one of our larger dockets that we've been working on and it's been in effect since 2016. Um, and for context, I was still working on my undergraduate degree in 2016, so it's been a while. Um, but we find that this study process really brings together all the appropriate information as well as some really technical and valuable resources that um, the Department of Energy has invested in as well as the PUC. And so we find that House Bill 1629 is premature and because we expect that study to be completed so quickly in the spring, we would really urge the committee to uh, be patient and to examine that study which will perhaps enlighten uh, many of the questions that have been asked here today. Um, briefly, I'll just highlight that we are also concerned that House Bill 1629 would negatively and abruptly impact the current and future economics of distributed energy resources in New Hampshire, all without taking into account the information in that study, in the VDER study. So, um, finally, I'll end with that we find that it is most appropriate to consider any changes to tariffs in the regulatory environment at the Public Utilities Commission, where those matters can be appropriately adjudicated and brought before the stakeholders that have been working on this for, say, six years now, quite a long time. Um, so with that, I would be happy to take any of your questions, and um, thank you for your time today. Thank you, Ms. Buchanan. Before we take any questions, I'm going to open the public hearing on House Bill 1248 and recess that public hearing until we complete the current public hearing. Now, questions for Ms. Buchanan. Representative Sompsich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Buchanan, for being here. Um, I was previously I asked one of the uh, uh, testifiers about if there is a quality difference between energy units generated one way versus another and it dawned on me from what someone's mentioned that when it comes to solar recs, uh, uh, renewable energy certificates generated by solar, the price is different in each of the states in New England. Can you tell me, for example, what the price approximately is in New Hampshire versus, let's say, in Connecticut? Uh, that's an excellent question. I don't have the exact price on top of my head. I know that it is lower Rex. in New Hampshire. Um, but I would, there might be someone behind me who would know the exact answer to that. Okay. Would follow up? Would you be surprised to, 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 if I told you that I'm pretty sure that it's $5 in New Hampshire and it's $34 in Connecticut? And that sounds about right from my experience. Okay, thank you. Okay, additional questions for Ms. Buchanan? Seeing none, I would like to call on the next uh, presenter for uh, this public hearing. We have one final card, and that is um, two representatives of the Granite State Hydropower Association, Ms. Kroll and Ms. Minot. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Um, again, for the record, my name is Heidi Kroll. I work at Gallagher, Callahan, and Gartrell, and I am representing Granite State Hydropower Association. And with me today is Madeline Minot uh, with Essex Hydro, which is a GSHA member. Um, we are very opposed to um, House Bill uh, 1629. Uh, I submitted um, written testimony via email to the committee yesterday and also passing around um, written testimony uh, right now. Um, we agree with a lot of the comments that have been made here today. Um, you know, first of all, as you've heard and you're well aware, there's a process going on at the PUC. Um, a lot of stakeholders have been involved and there was a lot of um, consensus and agreement around um, uh, the process that would take place uh, while, while the study was going on, uh, agreeing to the tariffs that are in place, which include default service as a, uh, an appropriate um, credit for excess generation that's put onto the grid by f facilities that are 100 kW or higher. Um, I did want to point out uh, in House Bill 1116 from 2016, uh, it reads in part, it is in the public interest to continue to provide reasonable opportunities for electric customers to invest in and interconnect customer generator facilities 
and receive fair compensation for such locally produced power while ensuring costs and benefits are fairly and transparently allocated among all customers. Um, when we read this bill, uh, as the other folks have testified, we really do see this as essentially setting the net metering credit at a wholesale rate or something close, and we do not think that that would be fair, um, fair compensation for the true value of um, net metered power that's put onto the grid. Um, and it's also important to recognize, and, and Madeline will talk about this a little bit more, um, if you were to adopt this legislation, it would certainly kill um, all efforts that uh, were put into motion when uh, House Bill 315 was passed last year, allowing for municipal host generators. Um, so again, that's uh, group net metering um, where uh, any excess generation put onto the grid by a generator um, is specifically earmarked for a group of customers, um, in this case under the law, a group of customers who are either municipal, county, school, um, any s those sorts of governmental type of entities. Um, and so setting the value when the generator puts the excess generation onto the grid, which is earmarked for those consumers, um, giving them a value of simply wholesale uh, price um, really will kill group net metering in that situation because there is, uh, you know, hydro facilities are, um, you know, in a lot of cases, wholesale prices are barely helping to cover their costs and there's really no room in there at all to give savings um, to the group members. Um, so again, I'll, I'll let Madeline speak more, but we really, uh, are opposed to this bill because we think that it undermines the fair compensation um, for the, tr the true value of excess generation put onto the grid. I'll make a, a few points. So to add to that, um, a, a current existing generator would actually lose money by becoming a group net metering host if this bill were to pass compared to being a wholesale market participant. So uh, they would, they would be, uh, a huge financial disincentive to participate in group net metering, being a group net metering host, and returning some of those savings to customers that would want to participate in group net metering with such a local renewable host. So um, it's, I think, important to recognize the fair value, as has been explained by several of the previous testimonies, to speak to some of the components that are proposed to be removed here from the net metering credit, um, for example, capacity. Um, distributed generation and customer generators, I think, absolutely deserve compensation for capacity. The sponsor said that he thought they didn't because they are not firm power. So to be clear, in ISO New England, the capacity market is not only open to um, what he described as firm power, it's open to all generation, all types of generation, renewable, intermittent. It's even open to non-generation resources like demand response and energy efficiency. So distributed generation either avoids the capacity cost, so it no doesn't have to be paid if they're acting like a load reducer, or if you're a previous market participant and had already bid into the capacity auction, your capacity payments are actually transferred to your host utility, which goes to reducing the cost of the credit, or they're getting the credit and then they give it to you. They give it back to you in your net metering credit. So I think that it would be co actually completely unfair to take that away and a generator that is somewhat sizable, if they were to participate in the wholesale market, would be getting those capacity payments. And so that's where that financial disincentive comes in, that they actually um, would not, you know, as, as Heidi said, it would kill something like group net metering, which also does have some administrative costs um, to recruit your members, to manage your members. You also have to track all of your members' uh, usage monthly so that you can file a required annual report. So there is some management and all of that administrative work and associated cost is something that the utility doesn't have to do because in some other states, group net metering or community solar is managed by the utilities and that's then a cost that the utility incurs. Here in New Hampshire, the group hosts incur that typically. So um, this just to get to some of those components, we agree that at least the default service, all of it, compensation in a rough amount value is what would be the fair compensation for customer generators. 
Okay, questions for these um, uh, testifiers. I have one for you. The California Public Utilities Commission just recently issued a recommendation that net metering costs be lowered from retail in California to the wholesale level. And their reasoning was that net metering charges have escalated in California to the point where they were concerned that these high electricity costs would discourage the adoption of electric vehicles and the adoption of other electrification, such as heating systems, uh, that could uh, advance their net zero goals. They were also extremely concerned about the fact that net metering driving up electricity costs hurts low-income people the most. Do you fear that that kind of thing could happen in New Hampshire if we don't get firm control over net metering costs? No, not at all. Um, you're talking about a state that had full retail net metering credit with an incredibly high penetration of solar and other net metered resources. Here in New Hampshire, we're still at an extremely low penetration. And since 2017, there are no net metered facilities or customer generators that are compensated at full retail. And so long before we get anywhere near the penetration of even our neighbors like Vermont or Massachusetts, the credit for customer generators is already significantly below full retail. Therefore, we would never get to a point like California, the situation in California, which granted they've had incredible pushback against that decision. Is there concern that high electricity prices could discourage the adoption of other electrification uh, projects such as a, a move to electrical ve electric vehicles or um, electric heating I mean, uh, devices? Is that a, a justified concern? If you want to talk about high electricity prices, I'm a Unitel customer here in Concord, and our default service rates just went through the roof. And uh, that is not due to distributed energy resources. That's due to natural gas markets. So, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, I have a heat pump, and I'm heating with it, and it's pretty expensive to heat my house this winter because of the natural, the international natural gas markets. So, I mean, yes, but does that have anything to do with net metering in New Hampshire? No. Okay, thank you. Additional questions for. I, your I would just add to that, Mr. Chairman, if I could. That um, yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I'll be I'll be brief, but I was just going to say that. Um, you know, from our perspective, uh, we believe that more renewable distributed resources throughout the grid could actually add stability and over the long term keep prices lower um, than the volatility that we're seeing in the markets that, and, and competing on a national and international basis, um, keeping it local. Uh, and these are very stable um, prices, relatively speaking, that come from renewable resources compared with other um, generation sources that we, we have right now. Okay, thank you. Additional questions for these ladies. Representative McGee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking my question. Um, a, a, as I listen to you speak, uh, and whenever we get speakers that actually have extensive experience, we, we get uh, a lot of nuance in terms of what's involved in, uh, in, in pricing and in the field and what goes into uh, the markets. But our committee has a lot of conversations that revolve around competition. And what I'm hearing today is that we're, we're kind of mixing apples and oranges because my understanding is that, that the original deregulation was to help bring competition to the retail generation markets. And we're talking about crossing a retail contributor with wholesale pricing, which is another, a different animal. And so I, I, I wonder if you could say a little bit about that because I think it depends on what problem we're trying to solve. And I, I, I thought what we were looking at was trying to figure out how to make that competitive market work the way we would like it to work. And yet it seems like we're doing something that's 
that's not centered around um, enhancing or diversifying the retail market when we're talking about applying wholesale rates, which is really a different kettle of fish. I know it's a long question. But. You're absolutely right. I mean, the electric industry restructuring statute um, talks about competition at both the wholesale and the retail levels. And, you know, we've, as a region, have done a lot of work. There's been a lot of advancements in getting a very robust wholesale competitive yep. market. But there's still a lot to be done at the retail level in making sure that consumers really do have choices and competitive options and, frankly, energy independence. Mm -hmm. And all of that is where um, locally, you know, locally um, s cited uh, small scale renewable resources uh, really comes into play. Thank you. Representative Sompsich has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking my question. Um, could you comment a little bit about how you see uh, net meter generators' um, contributions to stabilizing energy prices for New Hampshire residents? Um, in particular, like was mentioned, the spikes in natural gas supply and prices. How, how does net metering uh, contribute in, the, in that equation? So diversifying our generation resources in general, including scale and fuel type or generation types, will great, you know, diversifying our generation resources would help make this region less vulnerable to spikes in one specific fuel type. So the ISO New England wholesale market currently is, I would say, over-reliant in natural gas generation. A lot of those generators to somewhat protect themselves against some of those very high volatility and pricing that we've seen this winter are also dual fuel. And so this winter we've seen a lot of oil generation in the grid kick on because when they, when heating oil, when oil is actually cheaper than natural gas, they'll switch, which contributes to both having a dirtier grid and having these high prices because that's also not cheap. Uh, everybody that heats with oil is pretty familiar with that this winter as well. So having, uh, you know, not all of, you know, it's the classic, having not all of, all of our eggs in one basket le makes us less vulnerable to the price volatility of the fuel if, ev if all of your eggs are in the natural gas basket. And like this winter, we've seen very high spikes in natural gas prices. Um, that's resulted in much higher default service bids, especially in certain utilities. As I said, you know, Unitil, the default service rate is in the high teens, which we haven't seen that in quite a while. And even Eversource is 10.63, I think. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Seeing no further questions, I would like to thank uh, both of you for presenting here this afternoon. And I would like to close the public hearing on House Bill 1629 and ask Representative Pimentel to Read off the blue sheet numbers for that bill, please. I already have a card for you on this. Uh, oh, you yes. Okay, great. So, thank you for filling out a second Mr. Chairman, one. Chairman, there are <laughs> okay. Thank there you. are four names on the blue sheet, and they were all opposed. And on the um, House remote testimony, there were two in support and 113 opposed. Okay, thank you very much. So now, let's open the public hearing on House Bill 1248 relative to the replacement power for net metering customer generators. And I will introduce the prime sponsor of this legislation, Representative White, to introduce the legislation. Thank you, Chairman, <clears throat> and thank you, members of the committee. I'll try to keep this brief. I know we're running over. Uh, House Bill. 1248 is a bill that would require that certain customer generators provide replacement power when they cannot meet their grid export obligations. That might throw up red flags for some people here. After discussion with friends of the Department of Energy and bouncing ideas off of other people, I believe that the, this bill should not be passed in its current form. Uh, it's likely premature at the current time as well. Uh, the bill depends on a statutory obligation that simply does not exist currently. 
I'm still exploring ways that this obligation could be imposed should we decide that we need it and would welcome that discussion among this committee in both timing of and best practices for implementing such an obligation. With that said, I think it's important to explain my reasoning for introducing this bill <clears throat> in hopes that it can stir up some ideas and discussion. The general idea behind this is to reduce risk. We've talked a lot uh, today about grid stabilization. We've talked about Texas, both last year and this year. Uh, rising prices, inflation, all these things, these are all concerns and having a stable grid and stable power and stable prices is important. <clears throat> As our grid continues to become more decentralized, which I encourage, and adds additional renewable energy sources, these sources will provide a larger and larger percentage of our state's energy needs. I personally think renewable adoption is great. I'd love to see it at 50%. I think currently it's at what, 8% of our grid production is renewable, give or take, depending on how you calculate it. Um, but these sources are intermittent, and as such, that introduces risk to our grid. <clears throat> so as their market share increases, so do the risks associated with depending on these. The goal with this bill, or a future bill, would be to ensure that large customer generators whom the grid becomes dependent on, much like traditional utilities, provide some type of insurance. While I do not intend to discourage renewable adoption, I personally am planning on adopting at least two solar installs on my property over the next two years, <clears throat> especially not in the short term, excuse me. While I do not intend to discourage renewable adoption, especially not in the short term, I do believe that it's our responsibility to continually assess risk for our constituents to ensure a stable power grid. Thank you for the time. I would ask that this bill be referred to interim study, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Representative White, for introducing this bill. To make sure I understand the concept, are you basically saying that uh, net metered generation is typically renewable, comes from renewable sources, either solar, hydro, possibly wind, and that because those sources are intermittent, you feel there needs to be some requirement that when they can't provide their output, they have to, uh, from, from the generation source uh, specified, they have to provide it from some other source? If, if, if effectively, yes. Um, it, it's simple math. Look at it. At only 8% of the grid, it's not a big risk, right? These, these can go on and off all day long. It's not a big deal. At 20%, 30%, 50%, whatever that becomes 10 years from now, 20 years from now, that's something we need to be concerned about because that's now 50% of our grid that is intermittent. That this is just simply looking at the basics. Now there are things, we have organizations that oversee this and try to stabilize this. We have systems in place to make sure this is smooth. But as we've seen from Texas, <laughs> that's not always the case. Granted, I think our, I think I've lived in Texas. I grew up in Texas and prior to living here, I lived there for three years. I've lived in different areas of Texas that have different uh, that are regulated in different ways, either through a co-op or through a traditional utility, or where I can just go and pick my utility as well. Um, I think our s regulatory system here is actually better than Texas's in many ways. Um, I think it provides for a more stable grid. Um, that might not, people might disagree with me, but my experience tells me so. <laughs> um, so yes, I, I think to answer your question, yes. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, Representative Callie Pitts has a question. Yes, I do. Um, thank you for taking the question. The first question I have is why wouldn't you want this bill to be inexpedient to legislate while you work on the particulars that you want to work on? Um, that's the first question. So could you answer that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one, because I don't think my ideas are the only important ones in this room. I think there's a lot, a lot of brains here with a lot of better ideas um, that could potentially see angles that need to be tweaked, just like, just like we're seeing with this previous bill, right? With this, where we found a loophole. This has been around for five years, and we haven't plugged a loophole in the, uh, what Mr. Bilo testified to, right? So five, six years now, we have a loophole and, and a mishmash, right? And we had a lot of brains on that. There's a lot of people looking at that for many years. 
So the more, the more eyes, the more people thinking, the more people strategizing and discussing, I think we can eventually come up with a good law, that would be my hope, that could help, help in the future to in ensure this. May I follow up? Follow up. If you, what I perceive this bill to be saying is that if I have two megawatts of generation, and for some reason my generation fails, that I must provide another source of power, another source of generation, it doesn't say equal to, but I would think you'd want it to be somewhat equal to, mm -hmm. and is that, is that what this bill says? Because I, you know, we, we know, I think, that there's a lot of things that have been up and running for a while and that will probably fail eventually. Mm -hmm. So you were saying that one of the downfalls of starting a solar farm or whatever you're going to start is that if that fails or well, it becomes obsolescent for some reason, that you as the generator must provide an alternative source to that? Is that what this bill says? In short, yes. In long, it's more complicated than that. Um, we are becoming dependent on non-utilities. There are no obligations. Mm, there are no obligations for me and my 4.99 megawatt farm to stay plugged in. Uh, it doesn't exist. If I'm participating in this particular program. So that's the concern is as more and more, as we become more and more dependent on these non-utilities, that's a risk in our electrical grid. Um, and so the idea is to smooth out that risk. Uh, now it's not, it's not an issue right now, right? Because again, it's only seven, eight percent of our grid. It's not, it's not a huge, it affects our prices, but it's not gonna affect not having power for a week, right? Usually. Sorry. Thank you. Didn't mean to interrupt you. I apologize. Representative Thomas is recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, I, th I think the idea of this bill is great. I think if you promise to, to deliver something and you're getting paid for it and you don't deliver on your promise, you should be either penalized or provide a uh, uh, reciprocal product that, that you had uh, promised for. But I, w I was going to ask you, um, based on what you were saying and you're re uh, recommending I ITL, are, are you implying that rather than have this committee spend some time trying to fix a, a bill that may not be fixable, it would be better to come back uh, at a, a later time when people have done, maybe a collaborative people have done more research and effort into a better worded bill? Yeah. Yeah, I'm open to that. That's that's at the discretion of this committee. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, interim study would be m my recommendation, just so that we could spend time looking into this. Although I'm not 100% certain on the logistics of how interim study works. I guess I'll learn that with the new interim study I'm on. But <laughs> well, follow up. Follow up. Uh, I, well, you, you you were recommending ITL. No. I was recommending interim study. She she introduced the idea of ITL. Oh, I, I, excuse me. I was uh, misinformed. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Representative Plett is recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for taking my question. Partially because I'm struggling to, uh, with a clerk job and messing it up from time to time. I didn't. <laughs> I can hear, relate. I, I didn't hear your answer, why you want to pull this, why you don't think it's ready for prime time? Uh, it's not ready for prime time because it depends on an obligation that doesn't exist. It, this, is, this obligates, this says that if you're a customer generator generating two megawatts, uh, if you're gonna unplug, you have to provide backup. Well, there is no obligation for you to provide two megawatts. You, you can unplug. <laughs> so, so it simply doesn't work. If we pass it as it is today, it, it doesn't do anything because that obligation doesn't exist otherwise. Okay, thank you. More questions. Uh, Representative Lewicki is recognized for a question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Representative. Um, might you be pointing at the need for us to have more intermittent peak load generating power that uh, can be called on reliably when it's needed? Yes. Succinct. 
Love those <laughs> kinds of answers. I wish that our questions could be that succinct. <laughs> Uh, Representative uh, McGee, you got a succinct question? Uh -huh. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Uh, I believe I do, but it does require a little of a pre precursor. Um, I, I think the, the concept of the bill, I understand where you're going with the grid security and all that. It's a big topic. Um, but I think some of the stuff is getting mixed up a little bit because a, a lot of the generators are being seen, even by the ISO New England, as load reducers because they're not ISO New England assets, which means they aren't part of the risk that's being managed for reliability of the grid by the ISO New England in general. Um, right. So there is, there's more of a conversation to have around how to do this right. I Agreed. understand what you're saying about obligation, um, but I guess my question is, uh, it, it appears that your bill is trying to get at who is required to manage the risk. And, th and what you're saying is the individual who is looking to produce solar and maybe use it locally or sell it locally if they're a, a generator uh, should share in the risk of reliability that the grid operators have. And I think that's, I you think know, there's a bigger conversation there. I, I think that's open to debate and I think it likely only applies to certain customer generators of a certain size. And again, that's open to debate and at the discretion of this committee to determine. Um, may I follow? Follow up. Yeah, I think I think that that's what the ISO New England does, though. If if there's an asset that's being leveraged uh, in their giant board that we went and visited a couple of years ago, you'd have to go see it at, at ISO New England. Uh, you know, there are categories of generators that are are uh, legitimate assets uh, mm -hmm. that they manage. They are in a different category than the people that you're trying to pull into that category. So I think we, we probably would have to have more conversation around really what the objective is because if these folks are not being looked at as load reducers and they're being looked at as people that have to constantly produce or they're going to be penalized, then you are going to kill yeah. uh, the adoption. And I think you said that that was not your aim, right? Yeah, my aim is not to kill the adoption, but there is going to become, there will be a point in time where we don't look at them as load reducers. We look at them as effectively you power you to you energy utilities because yeah. we are so dependent on them yep. which is fine I, I i'm okay with that growing and and that adoption taking place but that that is something that we need to be looking out for over the next several years decade who knows right we mm -hmm. don't know obviously our adoption's slower here in this state um that i expect that to change simply based on market forces we have compounding inflation logistical supply chain issues, uh, fuel, uh, you know, fuel doesn't last forever. Um, <laughs> there's all kinds of different things, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I fully expect just based on market forces, we will continue to adopt more solar, wind, and renewable energies. Um, so th this is, this will become an issue. If it's not this year or next year, maybe it's next decade. I don't know. Yeah, but, well. A follow up? Yeah. It, the last thing I'll say is just we're not Texas, right? We're not deregulated. Right. So we actually have regulators whose responsibility it is to manage the reliability of the grid. So I think that's, you know, w w we need to understand the full picture mm -hmm. before we start inserting ourselves saying we have to solve this problem because I'm not sure we can solve it from here. Okay, sure. remember, we're not here to discuss or to debate. We're here to ask questions. Representative Thompson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. White, for being here. Mm -hmm. And I, too, agree with the premise of your bill. I think it's, it's only sensible to say if you promise something, you have to deliver it. God knows the state has made many promises that it's never <laughs> kept. And it However, will continue to make more. Um, one thing I'm a little perplexed about, a, 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 unit, a, a generator of one megawatt peak, I think, is maybe a couple thousand panels. It's, it's a big place. Uh, if I were an investor, or a municipality, and I built something like that, uh, I would definitely want to make sure that I get my money's worth. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm buying it, or I have a market for it, and so someone who's buying it for me has an agreement with me, a contractual agreement, so there's no way I can default on that without some kind of penalty. So I think that's the way it is right now that nobody would be foolish enough to create something like this and then when they can't deliver, they say, sorry, I don't have enough power for you today. You have a contractual legal obligation mm -hmm. right now. 
Otherwise, nobody would invest or build something like that. Is, is that, is that correct uh, that this is what's happening now? I, I, as far as I know, that's the normal pattern. I, I'm not 100% certain, but that sounds correct. Yes. Okay. That, I, I believe that's how it operates. Be, uh, I believe someone testified earlier that there are lar these large installs have a direct buyer, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, any further questions? Seeing none, I will call on our last testifier on this bill. That would be Joseph Kwasnick of Concord, representing himself. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to defer testimony, uh, given that this will also go to income study. Okay, Mr. Kwasnick uh, has uh, deferred his testimony, so I guess we're done on this bill. And. Uh, just been handed another pink card. Kelly Buchanan of Clean Energy New Hampshire would like to uh, testify. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would Chair. remind everyone uh, if you want to testify, you have to submit a pink card. Otherwise, uh, we're we're out here. We're out of here. <laughs> I apologize for tempting you with the option of release, um, but I, I appreciate your patience um, and the opportunity to give some brief remarks today. Um, I'm glad to hear that the sponsor of House Bill 1248 had some productive discussions with the Department of Energy and relevant stakeholders to really understand the mechanics and the difficulties with the bill as submitted. Um, so I'm going to deviate from my written testimony, which um, I have for you today a bit, and say that perhaps there are other ways in which um, we can address the intermittency of distributed energy resources. And it's you know, it's important to consider the importance of grid modernization and a smart grid that becomes more flexible, adaptable, and reactive to that intermittency issue. And so perhaps in light of that, there might be an opportunity in the future for the committee to examine that in more detail. Um, with that, I, um, I believe in terms of Clean Energy New Hampshire's position, position uh, we would be happy to hear that the bill goes to interim study or um, happy to consider uh, an ITL motion as as acceptable, um, and of course that's at the jurisdiction of the committee, but um, with that I'd be glad to take any questions um, and keep it brief today. Okay, thank you. Any questions for uh, Ms. Buchanan? Seeing none, I'll call on the next folks who want to testify, and that would be the, um, the ladies from the Granite State Hydropower Association, the tag team of <laughs> Ms. Kroll and Ms. Minot. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon. Again, for the record, my name is Heidi Kroll. I work at Gallagher, Callahan, and Gartrell, and I represent the Granite State Hydropower Association. And with me today is um, Madeline Minot um, with Essex Hydro, which is a member of the Granite State Hydropower Association. Um, I think a lot of the concerns that we had with this bill have already been addressed, and we're um, pleased to hear that this uh, sponsor has um, spoken with folks at the Department of Energy and, and otherwise to kind of understand um, one of the points we were going to make, which is that um, this concept of kind of export obligation doesn't really exist um, currently in the net metering and group net metering um, world. And the only thing I think we, at least I was going to add to the conversation, and it kind of came up a little bit, is that um, in the context of group net metering, there is a contractual arrangement between the generator um, and, and under our current law, the municipal host and the members in the group. And so um, in the context of negotiating that contract, um, which includes all kinds of terms and conditions, you know, uh, the consumers could um, require the generator to meet certain minimum performance standards. Um, they could uh, require that there be a guarantee to a minimum amount of um, financial savings um, to the group members under the contract. And so there is there is that, at least, um, I think, under the, the current scheme um, of how group net metering is working. So I just wanted to mention that. I'll just add that we, you know, we appreciate the sponsor's concern about grid reliability, but that is, you know, squarely in the purview of ISO New England to manage, uh, really. And I want to be careful not to lump all of the customer generators in the solar bucket, right? There are, we represent small hydro, and though uh, if we're run of river, we can be considered intermittent, it's in a very different way 
then solar or wind is intermittent. And so if you have a variety of renewable resources, they can actually complement each other very well and their generation profiles are very different. We are intermittent on a seasonal basis as opposed to a daily basis. Right now we're generating 24 seven very, very steadily, for example. Um, and then we also wanted to reiterate that any generator under five megawatts in New England has no generation obligation. So we own uh, hydro projects, one that is over five megawatts and all the rest are under. And those are treated extremely differently by ISO New England. The one that is over five megawatts is uh, visible to ISO New England at all times. We have to be able 24 seven to take a curtailment signal or to take a must generate signal. All of the ones under five megawatts, which is regardless of what generation type it is, this would apply if you had a four megawatt natural gas plant which probably doesn't exist, but it would. It would be treated the same way. It's based on how much you can generate, not what you generate with. Um, so those are treated very differently. So any generator under five megawatts, you know, truly has no uh, generation obligation regardless of what market it's participating in. So I did want to make that clear as well. Thank you. Would it be possible for either of you to procure and provide to this committee a copy of a group net metering <laughs> contract that we could look at to understand how group net metering contracts are structured and how it all works? I think they're all different. And if it is between two private businesses that is, uh, you know, they, they typically include a confidentiality clause. Um, I will say that there are um, anything that's with a municipality. So if you know, for example, your municipality has entered into a group net meter agreement, that likely had to be published in um, the, the city council or the, the select board agenda. So certainly I'm sure that there are some out there because there are municipalities participating in group net metering, but I don't have one to provide you. And as Heidi said, they are likely entirely different every Every agreement, you know, every member that I've, potential member that I've talked to wants different terms and conditions, either as far as exactly like performance guarantee or duration of the contract or different conditions under which they could leave or join or things like that. So I think they're all quite different. Yeah, I was looking for a sample, not <laughs> a, uh, just a representative sample contract, not a, a, a contract that, that would cover all possibilities. For yeah. But thank you for that. Uh, Representative Plett had a question. Let's see if I can remember. Uh, um, the, uh, your, your statement of ISO New England uh, over five megawatts and under five megawatts, I don't look at accurate, of course. Uh, as time goes on and the under five megawatts get bigger and bigger, a, a slice of the pie, could that change? And I realize this federal versus state jurisdictions, but if we want to keep a system together, maybe have some cooperation between the ISO New England and the states to procure information and to, to essentially dispatch, were they not now dispatching? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, of course, rules are not written in stone and they could, ISO New England could change their requirements. Um, utilities can change their interconnection requirements um, fairly willingly, actually. We're undergoing some of that in Maine, where Maine has seen a big boom in distributed generation. And as a result, even though we've been existing generators for a long time, uh, Central Maine Power is revising their interconnection agreements, which affects some of the existing resources, which um, their goal is to have more visibility into some of the smaller resources. So yes, of course, th that's why I said the reliability is ISO New England's primary responsibility. And so I have faith that they will do what is necessary to ensure that we continue to have a reliable grid. And if that means that we start to have more and more smaller resources, they may want more visibility into some of those smaller resources, and they have the ability to require that. Representative Callie Pitts has a question. My question would be that there's no, con if, if I understand you right, there's no contractual obligation for the smaller producers. And as I sit here, I, wonder if we are ignoring one branch of the government called the courts and whether we can or you can 
do you believe that you could, in your contract, compel a private business to do something that they are not capable of doing? I'm not Good. an attorney, I, so I'm not I, sure. I'm not going to even, I'm I asked the question. I'm not a contract attorney, so I'm not sure, but obviously if they're not capable of doing it, they're not capable of doing it. There could be in a contract a clause where there's a financial penalty for non-performance. Oh, That's typically how that right. shows up, right? If you can't generate, if you're, uh, you know, it's happened that major generators' connection to the grid goes down, right, in a big storm. They can't generate, even though they should be generating, and that causes some very big problems. They can't generate if they're not connected to the grid, or they at least can't put the power out there. They can't do what they can't do, but there can be financial penalties for failing to meet an obligation. Typically, that's how that And manages. Can I follow up? Follow up. Can that, and that could be a contractual, one of, one of your stipulations in your contract. Yep. that if you cannot perform or you choose not to perform that for the duration of whatever your contract is, there could be financial consequences. Yes, such as Heidi was mentioning in, for group hosts and group members, they negotiate the terms of their agreement. And so you could say that I'm your group member, even if you're not generating and not getting paid, I expect a certain amount of credit being shared with me so the, the host may not be making any revenue, but they've guaranteed that they're going to make a minimum amount of payment to their members. So if their equipment breaks down and they can't generate for a whole year, but in, under their contract terms, they've said we will share a certain minimum amount of That's value fair. with you, they're still going to make those payments. Thank Otherwise, you. they'll be in breach of their contract. Thank you. Okay, before I call on the next questioner, I just want to point out we have one more person who has signed up to testify on this bill. And I'm going to close this public hearing at 2.55 so that we can take a five minute break before the next public hearing starts. So I just want to alert everybody to that reality. Representative Sompsich has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for taking my question. This question goes to Ms. Minot. Uh, because uh, of the idea that <coughs> the contractual issues. Uh, I think you, your, your hydro uh, businesses probably have this all the time, but I'm assuming that you have similar contractual legal obligations to some of your customers to say, we will provide you with so much power. Um, and so w in your particular case or in that business case, uh, what are the clauses that, that would preclude, let's say, if all of a sudden something happened and you couldn't deliver, what is the, what is the normal remedy for that? Um, you know, I can't speak to the details of all of our contracts. We do um, market our energy in different ways. You know, they're not, some of them are group net metering hosts, but some of them um, have direct contracts with different purchasers. Um, I'll say that some, some purchasers go out specifically for um, guaranteed firm service in specific tranches. So there will be a peak, a guaranteed peak delivery, a guaranteed delivery. And we generally do shy away from that a little bit because the penalties can be extremely severe for non-performance. So um, yeah, usually you're either gonna have to pay them to be able to buy replacement power or buy the replacement power yourself to transfer to them. Thank you. Much as we all enjoy a good brainstorming <laughs> session, I think uh, we're going to cut this one short. And uh, thank you both for testifying and call on Griffin Roberge from the Department of Energy for uh, some final comments on House Bill 1248. Thank you, Chairman Vos, members of the committee. Uh, Griffin Roberge, New Hampshire Department of Energy. Uh, I'm going to keep it as brief as possible uh, at no surprise. DOE is neutral. Um, I did just want to say that I did reach out to Representative White, um, I think it was last week, maybe two weeks ago, uh, just to briefly discuss the bill. He and I had a good conversation on it and everything like that and certainly willing to uh, be part of any type of process to further talk about this language. But um, more or less what I wanted to say today has largely been expressed by people who testified earlier, you know, in short, New Hampshire doesn't have any type of 
statutory requirement for customer ge customer generators to fulfill any export obligations. So, the bill is requiring a re replacement power for an export obligation that doesn't exist. Um, again, certainly willing to uh, work with Representative White and other stakeholders on on this issue. But, um, like I said, most of my comments were have been addressed already. Great. Any questions for Mr. Roberge? Seeing none, I'm going to call the public hearing on House Bill 1248 uh, closed and ask Representative Pimentel to read us the blue sheet results. Mr. Chairman, there are three names on the uh, blue sheet, all opposed, and on the uh, remote testifying, uh, one support and 115 opposed. Thank you very much. So we will be uh, taking a, a break until 3 o'clock, at which time we will come back to hear our final bill, our final House bill for this session year. That's HB 1491 FN local relative to natural gas transmission pipeline safety. We'll see you at 3 o'clock.
Okay, time for our final public hearing on a House bill for the uh, 2022 session year. And that is House Bill 1491-FN-Local. Don't ask me why it's not a early bill, but it's not. I have no idea why. It's relative to natural gas transmission pipeline safety. And I'm going to call first on the prime sponsor of this bill, Representative Joe Alexander, to introduce this legislation. Take it away, Joe. Uh, thank you, um, Chairman Vos and members of uh, Science, Technology, and Energy. I know you saved the best bill for last, so I appreciate that. Um, HP 1491 is, um, uh, for the record, my name is Joe Alexander. I represent the town of Goffstown, which is Hillsborough District 6. Um, HP 1491 is advanced notification legislation. So it seeks to create pipeline safety dialogue between property developers and owners and natural gas transmission pipeline um, operators uh, when new land use or property development is planned near a transmission pipeline. So why it's needed. Um, in Tennessee, developers built homes right up right up to a right of way, which resulted in landowners assuming the right of way was their backyard. Um, so they, they were building structures in unsafe manners. Um, in Pennsylvania, developer designed homes as close to 16 feet from a pipeline, which would then not allow them to make any more modifications to the existing development. Um, so with the early notification provided in this bill, we can prevent the necessary modifications um, that would take significant time and costs um, to developers later in the application or the building process. So um, this bill would basically make sure that the, the notification is in advanced, developers know where the pipeline is um, through mapping data, and then they can kind of modify their development based on that information provided. Um, so that would be within, that would require um, developers to notify the, the pipeline, um, existing pipeline in the state within a thousand feet of a proposed development. So this is good because by knowing where the pipeline is and how it's constructed, developers will be able to modify their designs on new developments with the location of the pipeline in mind. Um, and that's why you know, I solicited advice from different groups and um, this, this legislation is supported by New Hampshire Home Builders Association as kind of a preemptive um, way to make sure that we're developing in a safe um, way. So it, it's forward thinking. So currently there's really only, there's only one interstate pipeline. It's in Northern New Hampshire. Um, it goes through Burlington, through Berlin, Gorham, and into Maine. Um, it's about 80 miles long. So right now this bill would only affect that pipeline. Um, but if in the future there are pipelines being constructed, it would address um, those as well. So I, I believe strongly that workforce housing development is a very important issue facing New Hampshire. And, it, and I believe that this bill is gonna be preemptive to help handle um, some of these issues um, and make sure that development, that the conversation is had before the shovel breaks the ground on development. And um, I have an amendment available. I've solicited advice from the New Hampshire Municipal Association who was originally opposed to this bill. Um, but the amendment addresses their concerns and Nate is behind me able to address that as well. I'd be happy to hand that to the committee as well. So in conclusion, the amendment, um, the, this bill you know, has broad support. It's a preemptive me measure and allows for advanced notification. So I ask the committee um, for your support on this bill. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for bringing this important bill to us. Uh, looks like an excellent bill. I have one quick question. The bill specifies that for a new residential or non-residential development that is located in whole or part within 1,000 feet of the center point of a natural gas transmission pipeline. Where did the number 1,000 come from? Was that arbitrar arbitrarily chosen or is there, a, is there some uh, safety guidelines or science behind that number? Um, thank you for the question, Chairman. Um, I was under the impression and I have um, um, B.J. Perry is here to help address it. He's um, lobbying for the only pipeline in the New Hampshire. But um, from the experiences of the pipeline companies, most of the issues that come from the pipeline really affect the, the first thousand feet. And after that, um, the safety it, the safety is affected within the first thousand feet. And then after that, um, they can address it a little easier. So that's where all the problems arise. So the thousand feet comes from past experience with dealing with, with these issues? Yes, sir. 
Great, thank you. Further questions? Uh, Representative McGee has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank uh, you, Mr. Alexander, or Representative Alexander, for taking my question. So the purpose of the bill is to institute requirements around notice. Is that is that correct? Yep. Um, so the 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 permit shall not be issued unless one of these three requirements are met. So the developer has received written consent from a natural gas pipeline operator, number one. Or number two, the developer has not received the consent, but has filed with local land use board written correspondence from the pipeline operator demonstrating discussions have occurred. Mm -hmm. Or number three, the developer has filed dated and written correspondence with local land use boards that demonstrates attempts to contract the natural gas pipeline operator. So the, there's no way the pipeline company would be able to hinder the development um, as long as the developer has documented advance notification for the pipeline being constructed. Okay, thank you. And follow-up? Follow-up. Uh, and in follow-up, you mentioned that there's an amendment that was that maybe Patch would be speaking to after you, or Natch, I'm sorry. I always remember that it's pronounced Nate. like Patch. I'm Nate. Sorry. Nate, it is Nate. Nate. Okay, yeah. Nate. Um, you mentioned that uh, amendment, so you're not going to present it and he's going to present it, or you want to tell us what, what it is, the change that you're proposing? Yep, so um, I'm not a member of the committee, so I'd be happy to hand it to you, and hopefully somebody on the committee would be yep. able to pick this up. Um, thank you. <laughs> so I'm just going to keep one copy for myself. There you go. Um, so the amendment would do two things. The amendment would shift the responsibility for the notification of an application within 1,000 feet of the pipeline from the local land use board to the developer. So it would make the developer notify, not the local land use board. And that was a significant um, concern with NHMA. And I believe that helps address the fiscal note because if you look at the, um, the methodology, it basically says that there may be an indeterminable impact on local expenditures, and it doesn't say whether the form of notice it to a pipeline operator is required. So if you look at the methodology, mm -hmm. I, I believe the amendment fixes a lot of the um, fiscal impact of this bill, and I, I believe it would be um, negligible, if any, impact on it. So that shift of responsibility, and then number two, the local land use boards shall make available the national, national pipeline mapping system, geospatial data, which is already public information available for yep. people. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Further questions for uh, Representative Alexander, Representative Pimentel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Representative Alexander, for taking my question. Um, this is a great bill. Um, I'm just curious about um, what are the, are there any current restrictions about, I mean, obviously this is about notification, but restrictions on how close a development can actually be to the pipeline? Um, I don't know the exact foot, and I don't want to speak necessarily to buffer zone of, of that. I believe it's less than 100 feet, though. So but I have, I have somebody here that can answer that specific okay. for you. Thank you. You're welcome. Additional questions for Representative Alexander. J.D. Bernardi is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Uh, how does this bill interface uh, with uh, requirements from Dig Safe? Um, I believe this bill would comp complement the requirements in Dig Safe. So, so no, no problems of. Um, no, if that's, I'm I'm pretty sure Dig Safe is a national yeah. program. So it, it says in here um, that a natural gas transmission pipeline means an interstate pipeline, as that term is defined in U.S. Code Section 330115. So it says um, it it complements Dig Safe. It doesn't go against Dig Safe in any way. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, additional questions for Representative Alexander? Seeing none, I thank you, Representative, for introducing this legislation. Thank you, members of the committee. Looks like very solid legislation. I would like to call on our next presenter, who is B.J. Perry of Bedford, New Hampshire. He represents TC Energy and give us, will give us uh, the industry's view of this situation. Mr. Perry. Thank you very much. Thank you, committee. Appreciate the opportunity. Uh, thank you for uh, refer uh, Bernardi referencing Dig Safe. Appreciate that. It's always a great program, so it makes me happy when I hear people mention Dig Safe. Thank you. Uh, as Chairman Bose mentioned, my name is BJ Perry of Bedford, New Hampshire, and I'm with TC Energy's State Government and Community Relations Team. 
I thank you for providing TC Energy with the opportunity to offer testimony in support of, eight, of HB 1491, the Pipeline Safety Bill. As this is my first coming before the committee, I ask that you please be gentle. Um, <laughs> for over 70 years, TC Energy, uh, formerly known as TransCanada, has been providing energy, including natural gas, to consumers across the continent. In fact, TC Energy operates in 40 states here in the country and supplies more than 25% of the natural gas demand in North America. In New Hampshire, our interstate pipeline spans 80 miles across Coas County, connecting Vermont and Maine. Known as our Portland Natural Gas Transmission System, this line transports nearly 400,000 decatherms and has helped provide new opportunities to providing energy and economic development. As some members of this committee might know, our recent hot tap, tap tie-in project last summer up in Colebrook helped supply the necessary energy infrastructure for the rubber glove manufacturing company that was awarded a multi-million dollar defense contract and will help create up to 300 new jobs in, no in the North Country. On a personal note, as a lifelong resident of New Hampshire, it was a great honor to be part of this accomplishment for our state. And that's what TC Energy is all about, providing solutions and being part of some amazing programs that are making a difference. To that point, some of our other projects across North America include our EVC technology that converts methane to water vapor and CO2, thus reducing GHG, our Saddlebrook double-sided solar panel project, which can generate uh, enough electricity to power 30,000 homes, and TC Energy's Three Mile Canyon Farm project over in Oregon, where the extraction of methane gas from the, from the manure of 33,000 dairy cows is occurring, and RNG is traveling to California via our interconnect pipeline system, resulting in energy being provided to an energy-hungry state, along with the avoidance of 136,000 tons of CO2 a year, which translates to an annual GHG reduction of nearly 29,000 vehicles coming off the road. Along our commitment to new and sustainable energy is our commitment to safety, and that is why I'm here today. Our pipeline safety programs are among the most robust in the industry and the most important part of our business. One of the best demonstrations of our commitment to safety is our long-standing and ongoing pipeline integrity program. This annual process maintains the integrity, safety, and reliable operations of our pipeline systems. On top of this program, every mile of pipeline, pump, compressor facility, or generation station is made using proven technology and integrated industry-leading safety systems. Once constructed, all pipelines and facilities are monitored constantly, whether that's from inside the pipe, on the ground, or from the air. We've invested more than a billion dollars in these programs and believe more can be done, and that's why we're supporting and advocating for pipeline safety bills such as 1491. TC Energy supports this important bill and believes its provisions increase public and operator safety while preventing the potential for damage to interstate natural gas transmission pipelines. The communication framework established in this bill affords interstate pipeline operators the advanced data necessary to continue supporting the safe and reliable transportation of nat natural gas. HB 1491 promotes a heightened commitment to public and operator safety by requiring developers to provide gas transmission line operators with the advanced information needed to better adhere to the pipeline and hazardous material safety administration guidelines. Third party damage generally caused during construction and excavation activities remain a leading cause of pipeline as incidents. The communication framework established in 1491 greatly reduces the risk of third party damage to pipeline infrastructure by requiring affected stakeholders, the affected, the interstate pipeline company, that's me, uh, and, and the developer to collaborate and exchange information at an earliest possible opportunity. I hope my, uh, my comments today answered in some of your questions you might have and you learned a little bit more why we support uh, 1491. I know you guys have all worked really hard today, uh, and we're the last thing up on the agenda. So I'm happy to answer questions now or later to, uh, about our commitment to safety and other TC Energy programs you might want to learn about to ensure we have the necessary information you need uh, when, when making sure that we're doing everything we can for pipeline safety. I thank the interested parties for speaking in favor of this bill, and I appreciate your time not only to learn about pipeline safety, but for all the hard work you do for the people of New Hampshire. We can all agree that we're a special state and we are committed to safety, community, and all working together. HB 1491 just does that in true New Hampshire fashion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Excellent. Uh, Representative Platt has a question. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for addressing my question, Mr. Perry. 
You want a mile a minute that you were reading? Do you have uh, that testimony I that you do. can submit? Yeah, I'll be submitting it as well and emailing you guys as well. Thank you. I, I'll look it up and With my cell phone number, if that's the best way to call me as well. That's fine. Yeah. Just as long as I have it so I can supplement right here. Love it. Um, this bill is only a notification bill. Correct. It, in no way it tries to uh, increase what you uh, you paid for right of way. Uh, uh, and so you paid for that. You're not trying to expand it. It's just notification. No, it's notification as because we're getting closer to the right of way. Let's have the discussion early. Let's have the, the dialogue. So we're ensuring that we're doing everything we can to, you know, working together for pipeline safety as well as working together for development, especially in these rural areas in New Hampshire. Thank you. Uh, Representative Alexander in his testimony alluded to the fact that in Tennessee, some developers were apparently building houses as close as 16 feet from uh, a in, natural in a, gas pipeline. Could you explain to us what uh, some of the uh, safety hazards are in doing something like that? I'll let you use your imagination. Uh, but uh, no, that's in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, in Tennessee, they were building in the backyards. But I mean, when you're encroaching right on, that is some very, very controversial things. I mean, because once again, I'm talking about encroachment up to a thousand feet to encroach the right away. I mean, so if you're gonna dig a new pool, if you're gonna do something like that, I mean, you can you can ding the line. And that's the last thing we wanna do. I mean, because it's it's integrity and so forth. Now of course we pride ourselves on having one of the top safety commitments and you know of any energy company. So we're Johnny on the spot and we're gonna be right there to ensure that we're our asset and retainability team is right there to do everything we can and work with the, to uh, ensure safety and getting that line back up and running. So are there no setback requirements from pipeline right of ways? It, you would have to talk to local authorities across the country and, and, and so forth. I mean, so if we can have more dialogue and have more conversations to prevent this, then let's do it. That's why 1491 is so important because it gets us right to the, it gets right to the crux of the issue. Let's have a conversation, let's get it done, and let's ensure we have safety and we're having a great communication to put good new development in, in the state of New Hampshire. Okay, great, thank you. Representative Thomas has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair, thank you for taking my question. So explain to me um, how much further this bill takes um, us more than what we currently have uh, for the uh, Dig Safe program. So Dig Safe, you know, so it's, you know, Hey, well, I'm, I was literally going to say the commercial in my head. Uh, <laughs> and I'm, like I said, I'm happy you mentioned Dig. It makes me happy, by the way. You guys are saying Dig Safe. It makes me so happy to hear that because it's a great program, uh, great education program. It helps us. Um, there's it goes anywhere from based on local area. It could be 25 to 150 feet from a right of way. But once again, as we ta as Representative Alexander alluded to, and this, people are put it, you know, not realizing where that line really is. Where is that easement? Where is that right of way? And they're assuming that's their backyard. So let's try to prevent that. So that just adds a little bit more. You know, obviously it's a thousand feet because we'd like to have a little more safety and have a little more conversation. Uh, but that's what we need to do. Follow up. Thank you. So I know that in uh, my town of Londonderry, there is, I believe it's the Concord Lateral that runs through our backyard a few hundred feet off the back of our high school, I believe. Uh, but that area is, in some par parts, is marked by these orange and white poles yes. separated by a, a, some distance. Right. Is that the right of way or can they get, or is there some distance beyond those poles beyond that those people poles. are not supposed to beyond build anything? The, beyond those poles. And just, a rem and just a reminder, I just want to be uh, very clear on this, and you guys are great. And I, um, this is for interstate pipelines. This legislation is affecting interstate pipelines. So we're connect so when we're at, you know, up in up in Colas County. I see. Yeah, so it's not so it's not other pipeline companies, you know, it's interstate pipelines and in, in, in going through the state of New Hampshire. Thank you. Representative Callie Pitts has a question. When someone uh, builds a home or a business or whatever, they have to go through the local, I believe, the local planning boards or whatever controls, building, licensing, permitting, in their town or state. Mm -hmm. In Coas County, where you run through, have you given your maps of the uh, pipeline to the appropriate town officials and to the county planning board? 
That would be, so I don't want to give you the wrong answer uh, because that would be our land representatives who handle all of that for our company. Um, it is readily accessible online. We share those KMZs on a regular basis with anybody uh, you know, to, that they can understand and all those pipeline um, infrastructures are public record. But, uh, I'm hap but I'm happy to ensure to have my land representative reach out to you to walk you through our, our, our process so you can understand that. Because the last thing I want to do is give you the wrong information. You're right. <laughs> uh, way back, we had a house built that had a pipeline safety committee. And one of the concerns that we had was that some town officials, especially new town officials or people who haven't lived in a town for a long time, mm -hmm. were maybe not aware of what was under their feet. And that's why I... I would like that information if these planning boards and proper land use authorities have been notified. Absolutely. And, and I think that's really important. No, I think you're absolutely right. And we, like I said, we, uh, we constantly, our land representatives are constantly talking to local town officials uh, on a regular basis, uh, such as, as I referenced, the, uh, the, Col the Colbrook Hot Tap expansion. The permit cost $16.18. Uh, and that, you know, it's, you know, and they were, it was great. And, um, and it gave us the opportunity to share that information. And as I mentioned, we talk to land representatives, uh, community relations. We are talking to local people on a regular basis. The first thing you, you guys saw that I did when I got to this committee, I handed out an asset map of TC Energy, New Hampshire. So you guys saw that little blue line going across Coas County, uh, you know, giving you some key facts, including the $4.6 million in property taxes that we pay. Um, but, you know, it's the first thing I did. You know, because you know, traditionally, if, if, it was, if this was a TC Energy meeting, we'd start it with a safety moment. Uh, you know, very because safety is the number one most important thing to us. So if my bosses are watching, I'm probably going to get in trouble for not starting with a safety moment. <laughs> okay, Representative Murner is recognized for a question. Yes, I happen to be the uh, county planning board for the unincorporated towns and everything up there, and I can tell you we have detailed maps because the, the 4.6 million dollars you talk about—that's a that's a big thing on the tax tax base, utility tax bill, we had that bill years ago because that was one of the biggest screaming from all my towns up there when we were kicking around 700 a few years ago because that was a big source of income for the towns up there. So uh, it is watched and monitored very closely by the towns. And we did love did you have a question you wanted to ask? No, I just wanted somebody had asked. I was just answering Callie, ah, Jackie okay. Callie Pierce's question. Thank you. Uh, Representative Somsich has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Perry. Thank you. Um, so you, we were discussing previously this issue of why 1,000 feet, and we heard the 1,000 feet is kind of the, the largest area where there could be issues that may be damaging to the surrounding area. Mm -hmm. Could you kind of elaborate a little bit of what the typical problems could be in that 1,000 area? Distance. It could be the same thing as we mentioned. Just you know why 811 is just as important. It's you know it's, it's basically you know it's 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 811 on steroids, if you will, to put it in a better better way. And it's ensuring that you know within that thousand feet. I mean, because think about how many how many how many feet are we using in this building today? You know, would be would be you know if we were up in Coas County, would be close to encroaching on the pipeline. You know, and that's not just the building. It could be the parking lot. It could be other things that are that are being addressed to the foundation, etc. So we want to ensure that we are giving plenty of room. And the thing is, and it could be, it, remember, it's notification of up to 1,000 feet. We're not telling you to, to not do it from 1,000 feet. We're having conversations that if you're 1,000 feet away, let's review the plan collectively as a group and say, oh, no, your parking lot going over here, your driveway, okay, that's good. You know, it's like we just want to give one more sense of safety. Excuse me, Mr. Perry. My, that was not my question. My okay. question was, can you give us some examples of when there have been problems associated with natural gas pipelines where, where people were saying a thousand feet that's kind of a good distance where we can be sure that whatever happens people will be safe sure. can some you give us some some examples of what could happen not to say i'm not implying that it does right. all the time right. i'm um, just saying w some area some examples of why a thousand feet would be useful some of it is is regulatory reformed you know on, with, with with bisma um and you know as i mentioned the pipeline hazardous material safety administration under D, uh, dot uh, so some of that is based on th their numbers 
And then, um, as we alluded, it's just ensuring more dialogue, more conversation, and just making sure. I don't want to give you examples and put things into your head that you know could or could not happen. Um, that's not what I'm. I don't want to do that, to be honest with you, you know, or, or lead you down a road that you're thinking something else. I'm here to encourage advanced notification legislation to prevent safety. And I, like I said, on the regulatory side, I'm happy to put you in conversations with our regulatory people to help you better understand. Well, I still haven't heard an answer to the question of what incidents may have happened. That uh, Representative Sopcich, he did give you an no, he didn't. Answer. Yes, he did. <laughs> he said no he's not here. going to give you examples okay, so, of what so could or could not okay, happen. Good. Then, so then let's move let on. Let me ask a follow-up question different from what this. All right, make sure okay. it's different. Uh, I just wanted to inquire whether your company uh, has in any way been considering uh, the idea of transporting uh, not just methane but hydrogen in your pipelines or a mixture of the two. I know some utilities are doing that already. Sure, there's a lot of conversation with utility companies and energy companies that are having that, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, TC Energy prides itself on looking at all forms of energy. Uh, it's, it's who we are, it's what we do. I mean, we, as I mentioned, we, we are not afraid to explore all forms of energy, double-sided solar panels, uh, hydrogen, um, renewable natural gas, hydro. We'll have those conversations because, you know, when we're paying 163% more in energy costs up in this area, let's have a conversation about energy. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Good, good uh, response. Representative Parshall is recognized for a question. Thank you, Chair. And my uh, applause to uh, both yourself and the sponsor of the bill. It's very well drafted. Uh, I do have a question, and that is um, looking it over, understanding this is for interstate, uh, that they made that clear, but yes, sir. is this for development, for new developments, or if I have an existing um, if I, is, uh, it, so, to cite your example, if I want to put a pool in my backyard sure. um, and uh, I have an old parent right away in my backyard, but I'm still within a thousand foot of your pipeline, um, does that, will this apply to my uh, pool and will it be up to my local permit granting agent, my, 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 um, my municipal office to, uh, in granting a building permit? in order to make me aware of this situation? Well, your building permit is, con is will be handled through your building permit, uh, through your local authority. Yeah. Uh, the conversation uh, is for new developments uh, in the area, you know, I just use the pools trying to give a general uh, example, uh, new developments going up and new construction uh, along, an interstate, uh, along an interstate pipeline. Okay, so it doesn't imply existing construction. Thank you so much, thank you. Thank you, Representative Plett is recognized for a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Perry, has this legislation in similar form, if not the same form, been introduced and or passed in other states? Yes, sir. Uh, the state of Tennessee, uh, it is currently being voted on in the, in the Ohio legislature. It's being introduced in, in Kentucky as well. So I thought in good safety and good collaborative efforts here in the, in the 603 that I would uh, bring it to New Hampshire. Great idea. Representative Bernardi has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Perry, what type of markers exist on top of this interstate pipeline to, to give someone a visual that, hey, I may be a thousand feet and I better ask somebody? Uh, currently, uh, the, the markers that are indicated are all, well, along the route of our pipeline. So this is where you would work with, because, uh, I mean, it, it could be a thousand feet, could be going through, you know, an existing field of some sort, but having the conversation and w getting the KMZ file will determine exactly from the existence of the pipeline where those yellow markers are that we've indicated and seen. And you're welcome to come up to, to Coas County and uh, Repres Representative Murr and I will give you a nice little tour of it. Come, 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 and, see, come and see it. Um, you know, we'll go to the golf course too. Um, you'll, see, you'll see the yellow markers and then from there, it's a thousand feet from that pipeline. Thank you. Yeah. Representative McGee has a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Perry, for taking my question. Uh, so th based on the language in here, it says to the center line of the pipeline, 1,000 feet. So that would be 2,000 feet, right? 1,000 on each way. side. Thousand right. Way, yeah. So it's actually 2,000 feet times 80 miles. So it's, uh, it's quite a bit of land that you're talking about here. So uh, are you aware of any current projects in Coas County that would be impacted by the implementation of this law? Because I'm not just curious. Even, 
not to my understanding, of course, when we had the conversation with uh, uh, Renko, the uh, rubber glove manufacturing company, uh, we had dialogue from the get-go uh, to ensure that everything was, you know, integrity, safety, and everything was ready to go, and that we could have the demand ready to go for them, so we could help create 300 new jobs, and you know, for their 95,000 square foot addition that they put on. Yeah, there was 95,000. That was the facility, 90 or 95. I, uh, just a follow on. Follow up. Yeah. So, so you, it, you've had this interstate pipeline for a while. So I'm sure you know who your neighbors are. I guess the better question would be, are you aware of any um, businesses or landowners along the pipeline route that would be affected by this? Uh, you know, I would say if they sell that property, you know, and then they somebody wants to put a development in. That's the whole point of the legislation is that we can take those preventative measures and have those advanced conversations. So if I sold, if I own parcels of land up in, say, Gorham, for example, and I decide to sell them to, you know, a, you know ABC development company and they want to put something, the advanced notification legislation will, will kick into effect to make sure that, you know, TC Energy, hi, and, uh, and ABC building development would have a conversation so we can ensure safety and integrity and land conservation and preservation in, in the state of New Hampshire. So could you explain on page two, starting at line three, section five, it says upon receiving notice of a planned development in accordance with this section, a pipeline operator shall locate and mark the natural gas pipeline facilities and provide pipeline facility information to the developer by other means such as marking up design drawings and providing maps. Does that mean both physically on the ground as well as on design drawings? Is that the purpose of that Absolutely. section? Absolutely. Absolutely. Let's just have, let's cover one more line to ensure we're one more bite of safety. You know, just, you know, just like when DigSafe comes in and they're putting the lines on the ground. Absolutely. It's just giving us one more time. Here's your drawing. Here it is. You, know, you just saw it in person. Great. Thank you. Representative Callie Pitts has another question. I have a question on jurisdiction. Um, who controls these things on an interstate pipeline? Pipelines have been in the news lately. Are there different control factors for interstate versus intrastate? Yeah, well, I mean, it's all classifications and so forth and how we're regulated and we're regulated by FERC. That's what I thought. So may follow up? my follow-up would be is can we legitimately put these regulations into effect because they can be supersede can they be superseded by FERC so the conversation is about advanced notification legislation for act for them to obtain a permit a state permit a local municipal permit that is that is issued by them so it's the town I mean as you as you indicated and members indicated earlier it's the communities that issue the building permits so we're having the dialogue here to add one more bite of safety so we can so they can get that permit the local building permit so the answer is no FERC wouldn't uh, have any effect I mean, we pass it in Tennessee it's in Ohio and we're and we're and we're moving for and we're moving forward in New Hampshire and hopefully uh, Kentucky representative Lewicki has a question thank you mr. chairman um, my question is really not germane to this I'll take it offline okay thank you for recognizing that any additional questions? Representative Thomas has a question. Thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll assume I'm uh, filling in for Representative Lewicki's question uh, since I already asked two of them. Um, it suddenly came to my mind, does this legislation, would this pr uh, legislation effectively put, uh, I guess, TC Energy in, in a position where they could effectively deny a permit? No. No, it, it's it's creating conversation to conversation. We're you know we're not the local planning authority. It's it is the attempt of the of the person who wants to do the development to have conversation and dialogue with us to ensure they know where the pipeline is for pipeline safety. So f follow up. Follow up. So uh, not to reiterate, but then again, so uh, the local planning board could still uh, overrule your objection. Um, on we're that and and if they did is is there any recourse we're not objecting remember our our role in this is to have a dialogue of conversation relative to where they're building in the pipeline and provide feedback and information 
as it relates to regulations, as it relates to FISMA classifications, so they know when they're building where it's going to be. You know, the, uh, the, the yay or nay, our, and our role is supplying them, as indicated in this bill, the mapping ability, the, wh the plotting, and where it is, and where's a thousand feet from it. So that, but it goes back to the authority of the local planning board in, in obtaining their permit. We're, we're, we're just having, we're having the dialogue of conversation for, you know, for safety and integrity. Thank you. Okay, we, uh, we've got uh, two more people who, who want to testify here, so uh, make it quick, uh, Representative McGee. I will do so, thank you for indulging me, Mr. Chair. Um, when I'm looking at uh, the place that says the, uh, the jurisdiction of the local land use board, this is on page two, uh, section six, and I'm looking uh, at, at number A, it says um, the board uh, sh shall basically have jurisdiction um, to allow a building permit uh, if the developer has received written consent from the natural gas pipeline operator that uh, has filed this consent with such regional planning commission. And then it goes on to say, or these other things, right? right? So you can have reached out sure. and not have heard back yet. And you know, so you're trying to cover all contingencies, but sure. it does give the pipeline company the ability to respond and say no. Right. Yeah, we give our advice and say no, but you know, but that, but that is not our authority. Our, our intent here is to ensure that we are working with the the developer of this piece of property to ensure they know where the interstate pipeline is, so we can ensure safety and integrity. That's the crux of the bill. We're not, you know, we, we're we're not going to prevent economic development from happening from more housing coming into play. We don't want that. That's why we played a key role in the Colebrook Hot Tap project to allow 300 new jobs. You then know, we our, then our, we could our, our, our we could eliminate job. that if we wanted to then. That, you know, this is your bill. I'm, yeah. You know, I, I'm okay. here to talk. You know, why we're, we're advocating for this bill on, on a safety and integrity matter. Okay. Thank you. So no, thank you. I appreciate. It. That's a great <laughs> question. So, Representative McGee, are you advocating that we change the word "shall" on line seven to "may"? A building permit shall not be issued. Should we change that to may not be issued unless the following one of the following three conditions is met? Yeah, I don't know if that helps it. <laughs> I don't know if that solves for what I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, what are you saying, Jackie? All right. Well, we can discuss this later. I, I just wanted to understand what your question was. Uh, the point I'm making is that there's an explicit item here that says that we would be granting the, that the developer has received written consent from the natural gas pipeline operator and has filed this consent with the regional planning board. So if that consent isn't given, then that would prevent development, right? Unless one of the other two right. uh, but that conditions is, is yeah. met, but yeah. you're right, yeah. yes. Okay. Which is why I suggested that we may want to make it advisory rather than uh, make it mm. mandatory. Yeah. yeah. We should consider that anyway. Okay. We got to move on here, so I'm going to uh, thank Mr. Perry thank for his, um, his excellent testimony and excellent uh, answers to his questions and call Nate Grays from the New, Ma New Hampshire Mis <laughs> Municipal Association to testify on uh, this legislation. Mr. Grays. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Nate Grays for the New Hampshire Municipal Association. Uh, we do support this bill as amended. Um, as uh, Representative Alexander already described, the amendment would just change slightly how this operates, which would save some municipal costs. I guess the best way to think about this bill, or the way I think about it at least, is it essentially makes the pipeline operator in a butter if the pipeline is within a thousand feet of the property to be developed. Um, and so essentially, what that would do was require notification, just like any other abutter, and so the pipeline operator could come in and describe whether there's a problem. So, for example, if someone was going to dig a pool on top of where the pipeline is running through, that's going to be a problem. If someone's going to do blasting within a thousand feet, that's probably going to be a problem. Um, but if they're just going to pave a parking lot, that may not be a problem. Um, but in either case, or whatever the case may be, it gives the pipeline operator the opportunity to inform the planning board and so we don't have any accidents. And so that's what my thought about how this bill operates is and I'm happy to answer any questions. That's an excellent uh, description of the bill. 
in its essence. Are there any further questions for Mr. Gray? Representative Oxenham. I have a question about the, the thousand feet and, and the issue of abutters. If, if property lines, are, they're not always nice, neat rectangles, mm -hmm. and someone could own, you know, 40 feet at the, at the back end, and they're separated by someone else who is the abutter. So you're not the abutter, but you're within 1,000 feet. Are they going to be informed? Is, is there going to be a way for them to be informed if they're buying the property and they're thinking they're going to do something with those 40 feet? So it would, it would be the way this would work is if they propose a development. So if they're just buying the property, unless the owner tells them or they look out and see the yellow stakes or whatever, no, but presumably they, they know where the property is, presumably they've, they've walked around it before buying it. Um, but my assumption would be that, you know, if it's their property and then another property and then the pipeline and they want to dig a pool or whatever, when they notify the pipeline, the pipeline's going to look at the same maps everybody else's and say that's not an issue and let them know it's not going to be an issue because clearly they're, they're, building, <laughs> they're building on their property, not next to the pipeline. So that's my assumption of how it would work. Um, and you wouldn't hear an objection from the pipeline at the planning board session. Representative McGee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, Mr. Gray, for taking my question. Uh, I just wanted to ask whether you could speak to the amendment that I had asked prior speakers to speak to. Just tell me what it, in yep. essence, what you're trying to do with this. So it makes two changes. Um, one, it, it places the burden of notification on the applicant rather than the land use board, and that's consistent with mm -hmm. um, the statutes related to abutters, yeah. although it is often the case that land use boards will make the list of abutters in conjunction with the applicant and provide that notice upon payment of the fee. Presumably that's going to happen here. The other change, um, which is to Section 4, is it just changes uh, the effect of the bill as a whole, or the the bill as a whole to those municipalities that actually have a pipeline or which may have a pipeline in the future because it doesn't make a lot of sense for a municipality without an interstate pipeline to have to look at these maps and you know actually do work on this but it does make sense if you actually have a pipeline or if in the future a pipeline goes through um, just follow up follow up so the the notice on the applicant how would that work so the applicant would have to notify the, um, the pipeline operator um, who has presumably provided information to the municipality um, and worked with the municipality to, um, to, to have this information available. I'm just wondering how the, how the applicant might know who to <coughs> notify. I, I believe that information is available through the national pipeline mapping NPMS, uh, whatever the whatever the acronym stands for, the, the National Pipeline Mapping System. Um, I believe that contact information is available through them. I don't know how they would know. For clarification, then, I, I without this amendment, uh, Section Four would require every town in the state to uh, make National Pipeline Mapping System geospatial be geospatial data available. Uh, in its town, in its jurisdiction, is that correct? Correct. So this is a fairly significant change then? It is. Okay, thank you. And I would defer to the pipeline operators sitting behind me about how that, uh, that information would be available to applicants. Representative Callie Pitts. Just my convoluted mind thinking. If I own property and I own enough acreage that a pipeline is beneath that property and that property due to the pipeline is deemed unbuildable would then the pipeline operator have to pay or buy an easement on that property because that or is that taking of property by eminent domain because now my property cannot be built on or subdivided or whatever. Well, that's going to be a private dispute between uh, you, the property owner and the, and the pipeline operator that would not involve the municipality, so I couldn't answer that question. Uh, 
Uh, he's not the right person to answer that question. Mr. Roberge from the Department of Energy is here to answer questions. I'll uh, ask him maybe if he could answer that question. No. Well, just say yes or no, I can answer that question. Okay, thank you. We won't call you up then to answer that question. All right, uh, he doesn't, he can't answer the question, so maybe uh, the two gentlemen from who, either Mr. Perry from TC Energy or Representative Alexander could answer the question. Either one of you want to take a stab at it? So, up on the mic. Come up to the mic, please. So in circumstances similar to, to, to what you mentioned, you know, that would be a conversation that, you know, an, a company w could potentially have with a, uh, with, a with, with a property owner, you know, in obtaining or purchasing or uh, that piece of property, you know, so, and if you want for further clarity on that, I can, I can, I'm happy to, like I said, I'll put you in contact with the, uh, the, uh, the people who, who can answer those questions are on, on our land rep team because, you know, they're, they're going to give it to you. And, and if, if people know me when I say I'm going to do something, I do it. I so. Absolutely. Happy to do it. It's good. It's good. It's good dialogue. Representative Lewicki has a question. Who uh, do you want to direct a actually, question to? Actually, I can clarify on that if we would like. Okay. Uh, in the case of an existing pipeline, there already is an easement on the land, and it is in the deed for the land. A new pipeline would be a different matter. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right, uh, I think we've exhausted all the questions for these gentlemen. I uh, appreciate Mr. Gray's being here from the Municipal Association. The only card I have left is from Mr. Roberge from the Department of Energy. Does anybody think they have a question that they might like to ask him at this point? Seeing none. I would like to ask him, how do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> well, you can ask him that offline, okay? All right, seeing no further questions, then I'm going to close the public hearing on House Bill 1491. And I'm going to thank all members of the committee for another successful committee day. We heard a lot of uh, uh, bills today. We, we had a lot of great information exchange and uh, Representative Pimentel will now give us the blue sheet. Thank you, Mr. Sheet, Chairman. Uh, this was a very uh, popular bill. Uh, there's no names on the blue sheet and the remote testifying, one support and two oppose. Okay. Sounds pretty, uh, pretty simple. Does everyone return their name tag? Okay. Everybody uh, return your name tag to the basket over by the door. I will remind everyone that on Monday, the 14th, there is a work subcommittee work session on House Bill 1258, I believe it is, the DOE um, Department of Energy uh, amendment that's at 10 a.m. There is no committee meeting on Tuesday, the 15th. The House will be in session on the 16th and the 17th. My current plan is to schedule our next meeting on February 22nd, and that will be an executive, sec uh, executive session on probably half of the 20 remaining bills that we have to deal with. Mr. Chair? And then I will try to schedule another executive session on March the 1st. Mr. Representative Thomas. Oh, Representative Oxenham. When will we know which bills will be on the earlier date versus the March date? As soon as uh, Representative Thomas and I figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> any, any, any kind of an idea? I mean, would it be this um, week, next week? Certainly before I notice it n in next Wednesday's calendar. So I'll know by next Wednesday the 16th. Give us a lot of time. Yes, on Wednesday the, the 16th, we're meeting at 1 o'clock. Uh, at the Double Tree in Manchester. We'll meet in session until about 6 o'clock, and then the next day, Thursday, we'll come back at 9.30, and at 10 o'clock, the Senate will join us, and the, and the governor will issue his State of the State address, 
and then the Senate will leave and the House will return to session and finish all our early bills. Representative Oxenham. Yes, I, th I believe that they're going to restrict it just to the House and the Senate this year because of the ongoing COVID safety measures. So there will be no executive council, there will be no Supreme Court justices, and I don't believe there will be any other VIPs uh, there. That's, that's my understanding. Okay. Representative Sopcich. Uh Mr. Chairman, just wanted to know, did you receive all the minority reports yet? I have not, I have received only one, and I need the other minority reports uh, within the hour. So you submitted yours? Sent? Okay, no, I haven't checked my no, email, no, so I, I'm not mine. sure. You got mine? I got yours. You didn't get mine. I didn't get yours yet, but I haven't checked my email. Okay. No, I haven't sent it. Oh, you haven't sent it? That, that could be why I haven't gotten it. Okay. Uh, you're doing I haven't checked it lately. The, the core, the civil uh, climate <laughs> core. Which you know, you could you could just hand write it and give it to the clerk. That's what I did sometimes. Yeah, yeah. If you if you just write it up and give it to the clerk, they can submit it for you. 